and we are live. Josh, Josh Dobson here, mortgage expert, to break down the macro, right? Break down some of the macroeconomics that we're seeing. How you doing, Josh? I'm doing well, my friend. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Just uh, you know, I, I I saw the the ISM PMI go up, and I got a little excited. Bond market goes up. Okay, not too excited. Rate hikes, whatever. Uh, so what, what do you think is going on right now? What do you, which indicator, which macro indicator are you most focused on, or you think was the most significant over the past couple of days? Well, um, to be honest with you, I'm not sure uh, if anything in particular is what's giving us this lead towards you know lower price, um, but. I, I think it's all starting to come to a head. I, you know, I, I text you and I, I sent you the info, uh, found that video where they're talking about how uh, Bureau of Economic Activity is revising a ton of data lower over the last three years. And that just, I mean, that, that kind of goes in, in line with what, like, what I've been saying as far as people and what they've been experiencing versus what we've been told is happening. Right. Um, yeah, that is interesting. It's, it's a mess, bro. This is why we need blockchain that nobody, can you trust the data with you go there? I mean, this is probably why the bond market is tightening, right? The bond market is like, exactly. we don't believe anything that you're saying. We're going to force a recession. We're going to flush out the weakness regardless. And this move is, I mean, this is crushing, uh, you know, this, this is, is substantial. This is a big move, man. This is, I think we're back now. We're almost headed for 2001 levels. Yeah. I mean, a little further 2001 levels and i'm thinking it just goes and matches the the two year but yeah bond this is rate risk guys rate risk is uh tightening the market and you know what the market's actually holding in holding on pretty good for this move like yes it's pulling in i think we touched that 200 and we'll go over that we're going to touch that 200 moving average uh we could bounce and roll over we did that back here in march remember in march we had uh the s p was actually at risk of rolling over and we had a little bounce here. Um, we got that bounce at the 200, but it rolled over. It just wasn't strong enough. And then the banking crisis happened to actually cause the Fed to pivot. And, you know, the market started going higher. So maybe we get kind of a, a play, a playback of that uh, going forward. The positive here, oil, at least in the moment. has <laughs> It's coming down a little bit. <laughs> coming down a little bit, but it's done this before. Here, I was like, okay, oil's roll, uh, rolling over. We're, go you know, every the risks are down. And then boom, it just exploded. RSI uh, did get overblown, but it's pulled back. So yeah, oil probably keeps chugging higher too. Very risk off. Um, very risk off right now. The dollar also. Uh, what, I've never heard. Uh, actually, Josh, what are your thoughts on the dollar moving up? How do you, you know, how do you actually... That th that, look at that straight shot. This thing is just. What are your thoughts on the dollar, Josh? You got to think about it, man. Uh, the world is reliant on the U.S. dollar, and the Fed's been jacking up interest rates. Um, we're seeing uh, more information that's looking like you know. And we had uh, oh, what was her face, the Fed chair who spoke yesterday. She's she's out there talking about another rate hike this year. Um, so I think. The strong dollar is just a, a, a good indicator where people are, you know, putting their money as far as what's going on in, in the world economy. Was it Lail? Was it Brainerd? She's usually kind of bearish. It was. Lail Brainerd. Yeah, she's usually yeah. she if she's turning hawkish, then you know, you know something's up. And then you had Meister today also. Um, you had Meister today also. So yeah, let's take a look at the data that we just got. We're gonna go over this macro data and try to kind of fit it in here. So here's what we got this morning. Job openings uh, ticked up. Now they're still in the downtrend, but you know, this is why this is so confusing. You're ex I was like, Hey, there's no way job openings tick up. Right. All these layoffs. I mean, we've got more layoffs for the, from the strike Ford or GM. I don't know who it is. And I know that didn't play come into play for this reading, but still it, it ticked up, but it's not abnormal, right? It's, it ticks up and then it rolls over. So this is what I think kind of triggered the bond vigilantes to keep shorting because uh, a lot of people are buying bonds right now. So you basically got job openings coming in hotter than expected, which expectations are always the measurement for the initial move. Yep. And uh, November uh, rate hikes, I think I have it on here. The rate hike probability went up, not substantially, but it did go up and then yields up. You know, that's an excuse for yields to go higher. Dollar goes up following yields, stocks down. And then obviously bonds are getting absolutely crushed. I think this Gosh. is the 
biggest drawdown of all time for TLT. And it, it's been the biggest drawdown. And it just keeps getting bigger. Yeah, it's just continuing. Yields up, dollar, you know, whatever. So so we got that havoc in the market. Uh, job openings. How Now, job openings, the Fed, what is it, uh, Josh, from your perspective, what does the Fed want to see? Do you think the Fed kind, do you think this bothers the Fed or what do you think? I think they're going to let this one kind of roll off their back um, just because they have already told us they feel like the economy is doing well enough. Um, they haven't heard it too much. Um, but I do think that they're going to have to really take a look at it um, because you're talking about job openings. We're talking about people getting into the labor market where, you know, jobs being offered to these people. Um, so obviously there are more people wanting to hire more in some sectors, but I think the big question is what jobs are those? What sectors are they? Because that's going to be the bright spot in the economy going forward. Um, but I don't necessarily think the Fed's too worried about the job openings number, especially since this is in the rearview mirror for them as far as what they're expecting. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. Cause I think they can look through and say, Hey, it's, it's a blip, right? It's going to, it's overall, it's rolling over. But on the other side, the bond market's like, Oh, there's another excuse to keep selling off, yep. uh, to keep crushing the market. So that's a net negative for stocks. That's a net negative for the mortgage market. Anything change in mortgages or is it pretty slow? Oh, uh, no, we, we, we saw them tick up probably about 50 basis points today. Um, just on the jolts report. Okay, damn. Yeah, this data is, is getting crazy. Now on the upside, on the upside, we get the we have the ISM manufacturing. We talked about this last week where we thought it would go. I think it I think it moved it beat both of our expectations. It, it moved did. Up pretty quick. So yeah. three months in a row, ISM is up, right? What is this? This is the manufacturing index, um, our manufacturing activity. So you think of economic activity under the hood, not so much services. But the bigger tranchier stuff that moves underneath the hood, you don't really see it unless you're working in a, you know, I don't know who would be in manufacturing, like, uh, you know, building airplanes, building weapons, building whatever it is, housing, construction, stuff like that. So the less sexier stuff, right? Uh, but this usually indicates from my research, my understanding, it indicates uh, an expansion for the economy going forward. It's kind of like, forward pulled uh, GDP pulling it forward. And so three months in a row up is pretty strong. I did the market react negative. I don't think it was too negative. I think this is a definite positive. And the reason why uh, the more surprising part of it actually for me was the fact that uh, we had new orders. Well, first off, prices paid for the first time actually decelerated. So I was like, okay, no, uh, you know, what is it? Stagflation? Stagflation is typically the word that goes around that's like the worst you know the worst environment you can be in prices paid came down now there could be reasons for that those came down with oil prices up too right and then employ employment improves production improves new orders improves for me that says hey maybe we're in goldilocks for manufacturing it's starting to recover uh in the economy we're not getting inflation more productivity means you can grow without inflation pressures actually picking up what's your take on it josh yeah, see, my question here is what sector as far as private versus public are we talking about here? Um, one of the things that I had heard this morning and it made it very interesting is, is that we're seeing government spending being a larger portion of the GDP than the private sector. Um, and so it makes me wonder if a lot of this is going to be driven by government spending and how long can we continue the government spending? Okay, I see what you're saying. Um... I think that is key here. Government spending. I got on here fiscal. I think it's being driven by fiscal, obviously. And we talk about this all the time. Inflation Reduction Act coming in line, infrastructure bills being uh, building this, building that, whatever. And also the multifamily construction apartment bills. I mean, here in Phoenix, I know we're just here in Phoenix. They are going up so quick. It's insane. Yeah. The houses, like I have a little region around me. They were building houses really quick and they stopped. It was about... Yep six months ago they stopped and the apartments are exploding yeah uh, so i think that's where it's coming from and for you it sounds like from your perspective you're saying well this can't really continue uh to to boost gdp going forward right yep not not a chance i mean that's uh, again we talked about it as well you know the multifamily is a big piece of what's going to be the construction in residential going forward um because of home prices and interest rates 
you're going to see far fewer homes being built for people to buy and actually live in as far as owning. Um, they're going to be looking to build more rentals. Um, and that's, I think, going to be the new norm going forward as far as uh, residential construction or at least commercial construction when it comes to multifamily. Okay. And uh, do you think, because now I'm, over the weekend, I kind of thought about it, looked at the data. I'm thinking that really, we I think GDP stays up. I think headed into the, let's look at the GDP first. We, we're getting economic activity pickup um, in certain areas in manufacturing because of that government spend, because of the private investment, whatever, public investment. Um, and I think that's going to be one piece of growth that continues. The consumer is supposed to fall off, but I think, again, they're going to keep spending going into the holiday season. So are, you, are, we on, are we on the same page here? January, February is when growth really starts to decline. Yeah, I, I, you and I kind of both agree that we should see the holidays continue to see some growth. Um, you know, not much, um, but after the holiday season, um, when we get into the new year, especially in election year, uh, I really think that uh, the, the consumer has been hit a little bit harder than what we're being told. Um, and the writing will be on the wall come January, February, maybe even March. OK, yeah, that's that's what I'm, I'm, I think we have a Santa Claus rally. Um, and stocks for a very specific reason we'll go over uh, because the fourth quarter is usually the strongest October, you know, third quarter is the weakest, fourth quarter is the strongest. And maybe we play out. We've been pretty seasonal for stocks so far this uh, this year. The only negative is bonds are just terrible. This has never yeah. happened before. So who can survive? Well, we'll go over that. So this is Atlanta Fed GDP now cast. They're basically week to they actually do day to day but i'm like ah, i don't know if i trust that <laughs> uh day to day uh gdp forecast and we're still above 4.8 percent going forward so this is going to be very key to track i mean we're above all of q2 this is going to be key to track going into that first quarter to see how fast it drops um if it does because it does it does do day to day so if you guys ever want to look that up atlanta fed gdp now cast there's a new york fa uh there's a New York Fed now cast also, but it's it's like real GDP. And so it takes into account inflation, some other stuff and and in rates. And it's a little more confusing because rates move and inflation moves. So you're going to be confused. But for the most part, it's really the trend. Where's the trend headed? And right now it looks pretty strong. I think this does keep up. So keep that in mind. And this is, hey, year in rally for me. That's what I think. The, the S&P is extremely uh, oversold. So um, yeah, the S&P is extremely oversold. Now, I also wanted to take a look at this information. This was the personal income from the uh, economic, what is this? The Is it the BEA? The BEA, there you go. What is the BEA? The Bureau, the of, Bureau economic... of Economic Activity. Okay, Bureau of Economic Activity. Now, what is this? Sh this is showing us like what states are, are pretty hot, I think, and for spending, who are spending a little more. Yeah, the personal personal income change. Okay, so who's who's hot here? Washington, Oregon. This is really regional. Uh, New York. Let's see who's falling apart here. Arizona's okay. California and Arizona look pretty similar. Um, Oklahoma's coming down. Yeah, that's that's interesting to look at that. Q1 through Q3. Okay, now. Um, net earnings, right? This is basically composition of personal income for the United States, Q1 through Q2. So looking back on it, and I think this was sort of the analysis where the economy is getting revised lower. The the growth wasn't as strong as actually reported. That's kind of what you were talking about earlier. Yeah. And um, I think a lot of this was uh, more property income. And then property income, earnings from jobs, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I didn't take too much of a look at this. I just want to look at kind of what it looks like because I'm going to start using this going forward. And looking at the regions here, the personal income, because at the end of the day, GDI versus GDP, right? A lot of people use GDP, obviously, the market, whatever. But GDI is more so what incomes, and that's going to look forward into uh, growth because if you you know the incomes are going to determine the spending obviously right is that exactly you're right? talking about, you're talking about the consumer what they're bringing in as far as their income and how they're going to spend that is what they're kind of looking towards there they want to see kind of how people's incomes are growing versus inflation versus everything else so that they can kind of get an idea of where the consumer is and what they can do as far as their spending because again con consumption is a you know personal consumption is a big part of um, our GDP. Right. And also uh, going back, these numbers are so contradicting. I thought I had it on my Twitter. Maybe I don't. 
because personal incomes actually came in month over month for uh f- you know for the for the fed or whatever i don't know where that information comes now i'm questioning where does the information come from um spending was lower and incomes were up on a month over month basis but if this thing is showing a revision down it's kind of it's like what is going on here uh what is your what is your quick take on that do you think do you think it's time to ditch the data i mean we got true inflation on the blockchain kind of telling us where inflation is at let's take a look at that also but what do you think about the data how are you even tracking that now do you just distrust it how do you go forward with that so for me i think the the advantage of having social media and being you know day to day talking to people you you get a better feel for what's going on in the economy especially when you're trying to you know analyze the data because i don't necessarily trust the numbers that we're being fed um, I mean, just look at the jobs reports and the revisions lower every month. Um, and I think I think that's where a lot of this is misleading. Um, we're being told the economy is a lot stronger than it is. Um, and I think that's kind of what's given the Fed the ability to, to raise rates like they have, um, when in fact, they're just trying to fight inflation. And so it's it comes down to what you're hearing on the streets, I think, is more important than what you're seeing in the economic data. Um, so having conversations with your neighbors and your friends uh, is a lot better way to gauge how the economy is doing, especially with how much data is being manipulated as far as what we're being told versus what's actually happening. Oh, you know what? That guy you sent me also, he, he was saying, you know, not to get political, that during the Trump administration, the growth was actually stronger than reported. And this growth was weaker than actual reported. So yeah. that was very, dude, this is going to be insane. This next, uh, you know, going into Q1, I'm sorry, going into 2024, like we're probably going to see the craziest social media slash politics. I don't know if you're familiar with the Lincoln Project. Did we mention that last time? Uh, we didn't mention it last time, but I'm pretty familiar with it. I just got familiar with it this weekend. I watched about two episodes in the documentary. I was like, whoa, this is the future of elections, pure manipulation. Now, yeah. hey, for e- for either side, right? For either side. Exactly. But, yeah, it's not yes. one way or the other. It's, it's right. all of it. That's insane. And they did a great job. I was like, bro, the the conservative, uh, the conservatives won the election for Biden is what I came away with. The conservatives that were uh, ex Trump, what were they? What do they call them? The rhinos? I mean, they didn't call themselves that, but they put together an elaborate plan. They were on it. They took pictures of Trump's face and said, he's mad at this. He said, I was like, bro, that's insane. So this again, where I think blockchain comes in because we have to verify truth. And in this world, it's it's just insane. You have to do your research or stay with a channel that actually uh, keeps up with the new data that comes in or the changes, right? You can't trust anything. I don't even know anymore. So trueflation, what about this? So this is kind of contradictive. The Fed and it, people get pissed. They're like, inflation is actually higher. So how do you how do you square with this, Josh, where the trueflation, maybe you don't believe it, the blockchain is actually showing lower inflation than the government's reported, even though most people are saying, well, it should be higher. No, I mean, I honestly, I think it's a little bit better indicator because it's just saying that it's growing a lot less, not necessarily coming down in that sense. I don't, I I agree with this, right? We're not seeing prices getting jacked up in the grocery store. We're not seeing a lot of pressure on prices going up when we're spending money. So I think inflation has steadied and slowed quite a bit. And I think this is a good indicator, right? But we're talking, we're looking at this. I mean, you want to go back and look at that data, the data, Previous to this, when we were talking about inflation a year ago, mm-hmm. you know that number is going to be double digits versus what we were being told, you know, somewhere around seven, eight, nine uh, percent. I think what we saw was a dramatic increase in prices. The inflation was high and it, the prices were going up quickly. Um, but now we're starting to see that slow. And I think that's being driven by the fact that people are not able to spend as much. And, you know, and it, everything's working out the way it's supposed to. Um, so I don't necessarily think that it's wrong in saying that right now inflation is around 2.44%. Um, again, it's still rising, right? We're not talking about deflation or disinflation. We're just talking that inflation's slowed. It's not increasing as much as quickly as rapidly. Right. hundred percent. And I think, uh, this is where consumers are going to have to, I don't even know if they care. I don't think people really even care about the numbers. They really just care. How does that affect me? Uh, but that's where you can get manipulated also. And I think what it is, is I was trying to tell, uh, one of my friends that we taught, he's an entrepreneur. He has a couple of businesses and I was like, Hey, well, from the stock markets morning, from the stock market's point of view, 
as long as inflation on a month over month basis is lower than what stocks can appreciate or assets, it's okay. Yeah. Um, now for the consumer, obviously that's a, that's a problem because they don't measure month over month. They're looking at what did I pay last year in the last two years versus today? And I'm like, well, wages are up. It's funny because wage growth is outpacing inflation today. But if you draw it's back three years, catching back up, right? Yes. It's not necessarily yes. that that's, that's, that's been going on this whole time and people right, are right. able to, it, it, it's literally just trying to catch up where, from where we were, you know, during COVID and post COVID. Right. It's like an improvement, but it's all math. It's so much math. It's like, well, how to, so you're right. You got to ask the consumer how's, how it's really going. Food is insane. I know food is insane. Um, and maybe like, you know, investing in assets is your only way out. Just hold on, uh, get a better job, work more hours. It's, the, the, I don't know if there's a real answer to this, uh, at the moment. Is the answer more fiscal stimulus? I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, please no. God, no. Right? right. More fiscal stimulus means more inflation. Um, and yeah, it puts more money in your pocketbook and it will help you ride the storm, but it's just like borrowing on a credit card. Eventually you're going to have to pay it back somehow. And that's going right. to be in the form of inflation. So, I mean, it, it's, it, I think at the end of the day, it, we just need to kind of weather this storm. Um, and it's going to be an adjustment as far as the consumer spending, um, for the foreseeable future. Cause I don't necessarily think that catching up the catching up's happening. Uh, as fast as people would hope so. I mean, yeah, incomes are up. Um, inflation's lower than it was, but we, we were riding some high inflation for a pretty long time. Um, and, you know, you see the memes all the time. You know, this used to be, this this amount of groceries was 150 bucks prior to COVID. Now this is what I get. And it's a fraction of what you were getting. So I think everybody's feeling that. And I think that's where, um, as long as we can keep inflation lower, keep it down, we should be able to see, um, you know, people's income catch back up and get a little bit closer to where we were before. But I mean, I don't know if the Fed's done. I, I think they still have uh, a big fight ahead of them because people are going to expect inflation to come down quite a bit more um, and stay down while people's incomes are growing. Otherwise, you know, the one trillion in credit card debt goes to default. Banks start to see um, issues with, you know, what they've got and how they're going to fund their business going forward. You still have a lot of the regional banks hurting. Um, you have the commercial industry as far as uh, I, I was just reading an article the other day, a company, I think it was Kushner, a uh, couple billion dollars that he couldn't get funded to uh, extend out one of his projects. Um, so they're, they're not making the payments on it. Yeah, no, that's that's uh definitely that's what I was gonna go over next is this I think commercial real estate, I don't know if you'd agree with me, the biggest like okay, first let's take a step back. Uh we said okay, maybe the Fed won't hike. Now I'm thinking with this job openings report, maybe the Fed does hike. I'm like, dude, like there's no clarity. It's literally day to day here. So maybe they hike because it gives them an excuse also to tighten. Um, the recession is almost inevitable. It almost seems like the recession is inevitable, but it's like it keeps getting pushed down the road. Um, They're kicking the can down the road. I mean, that's what they continue to do. We talked about the government shutdown. They, they extended the the potential shutdown for another 45 days with a continuing resolution. I told you it would, if they did it, it would be a continuing resolution. They did it, um, but it was only for 45 days. So, you know, in 45 days, we're going to probably be having another conversation about whether or not the federal government's going to shut down. Um, especially when you have the infighting going on in the Republicans, Matt Gates pushing to out um, the speaker. Um, then you have the threat of them outing Matt Gates. So, Yo, what is that? Hold on, hold on. What is what is that about? I, I didn't even get into it. Why mm -hmm. is he trying to push out McCarthy? So Gates basically, when they agreed to give him the speakership, right, when they were voting on it, um, they had him agree to certain terms. Um, and those terms, according to Matt Gates, have not been met. Um, there were several different factors in him getting the speakership. And according to Matt Gates and the, the, the right wing that he kind of represents, uh, they don't feel like he's met his, um, his quota as far as getting the things done that they've asked him to. Um, and so they're unhappy. And because he said he would do this, he, Matt Gates feels like he has the ability to push this issue. Um, but I don't think he's 
going to get what he needs, especially because he's already getting threatened to be ousted himself. Okay. So basically the way, uh, the way the money was spent, the way that they're spending the money or the, what McCarthy agreed to, he basically took, took himself back on it. And yeah, that's, that's, that's some bull crap, man. They just, it, that's, that's just annoying. Like people don't need to deal with that. First of all, what what is your take on the, I think they stopped uh, What do they do? They said they wouldn't spend in Ukraine. Is that one of the, yeah. So the, that was, that. so a part of that continuing resolution was they would not extend funding in that continuing resolution to Ukraine. Cause that was part of the original continuing resolution was they were going to fund it again. Um, and now you've got reports coming out that the, the U S military is running out of money, uh, to be able to re, I guess, re up on their, um, munitions. Um, so they're claiming that we're running out of, you know, the goods and munitions we need for the U S military because right. we've been giving our equipment to Ukraine and that's been part of the funding. Okay. Well, that's a mess. This is, it, a, is. It, it almost feels like we have to collapse. Everything's going bad here. <laughs> um, right. But that's when I get bullish when everybody's like, it's so terrible. I think when those yields actually stop, because right now the way I look at it as a, as a trader, as a stock market guy is there's a lot of people who want to cover profits right now. Those yields are breaking out, which means they're in profit deeply. They're going to cover the market's going to bounce. And the real question is, once we do bounce, do we roll over again? That's where I'm like, OK, now I got to flip a little more bearish here. But we're going to bounce in the short term. Now, I am pointing out here uh, the KRE, the regional bank sector. This highlight is when they collapsed and when the Fed stepped in. You can see right as, right after they collapsed, basically, you saw uh, the Fed net liquidity. Um, this is just for the Fed. This is not global liquidity, but the Fed liquidity uh, picked up. This was the bank term funding program. Now, we say this all the time. Maybe it doesn't happen just because we keep talking about it. But if this does roll over again, do we see uh, another regional banking crisis? Or I don't know if it'd be a crisis because they kind of see it already ahead. But what we do want to see is this Fed net liquidity pick up. And right now, it is starting to pick. I mean, it's not really breaking out or anything. But I think the Fed's going to slowly inject liquidity. Um, and, and, and I was thinking there's two things that can break. Tell me if there's something else. It's either the regional banks or something in commercial real estate. I couldn't come out with any because like retailers, they're kind of commercial real estate too, to some degree. Right. right. So is there anything else that could break? It's not going to be stocks in my view uh, no. overall because most of them are refied. I mean, I'm sorry. Most of them, they already locked in low rates uh, after 2020. They locked in low rates and now they're they're parking their cash at the Fed, at the money market funds. And so they're able to fund their own debt right now, which is why I think equities keep going up during this holiday season, because, I mean, they, they're not rate sensitive right now. Uh, but is there something I'm missing here that could break other than regionals and commercial real estate? No, I, I, I honestly think that the commercial real estate is going to be what breaks us, um, I, because that's what's causing a lot of the regional bank issue um, beside, obviously, uh, their lack of liquidity. Um, you know, buying bonds and now it's being worthless compared to what they actually borrowed against. Um, I really think the commercial real estate side of this is what's going to drag a lot of those regional banks down. Um, and uh, I mean, you're going to have to, you're going to see a lot of the big companies um, who need to refi um, some of their commercial space. Um, they'll either have to inject their own cash into it to, to keep the, the space um, or they're just going to walk away from it or try to negotiate something with the banks. But if they negotiate something with the banks, especially some of these regional banks that were funding these deals, um, they're not going to have the capital to do it. Um, right. And that's where you're going to see the issue. Right. Yep. 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 That's that's what it sounds like. I'm glad you you know about this a little bit. I just look at the chart. I'm like, uh, <laughs> this thing is barfing right now. This uh, commercial real estate uh, barfing. Um, and they're way below the 200 moving average. So this is, we're looking for this. When does this happen? When do we get this big injection? Uh, probably not anytime soon here. So yeah, fourth quarter, I'm thinking this fourth quarter, we actually do pretty good because the RRP. So let's uh, move over here. The reverse repo is, is picking up again, made new highs. So shadow QE still online. Um, shadow QE still online. We see, obviously that's pushing up the, the fed net liquidity. That's part of it. 
And those two years, you know, two year rates aren't really moving. Oh, this is a little inverted. Let's go back here. Two year rates aren't really moving still. So I'm not too worried for stocks uh, because these two the short term rates are, are, are not really moving. Now, do short term rates have anything to do with your industry or do you guys only look at 10, 30? So typically we're looking at the 10 year um, short term, again, doesn't really have much of an impact on what we're doing because, you know, we're dealing in the 30 year fixed mortgages. We look for some of the longer term bonds, um, the short term bonds, uh, not really, don't really have an impact on what we're doing. Um, they do have a slight impact on some of the short term or shorter termed loans that we can do. Um, but typically they don't have a huge impact. Okay. And we see, yeah, you're right. And then bond bond uh, volatility is freaking spiking. This is this is a red. This is not good. No, this is big risk off. So again, our risk off parameters. You guys know this. You guys should know this. I know everybody's like, oh, I told you uh, the S and P would go back to 420. What I say? Well, if rates break out, if the dollar breaks out, if oil breaks out, then yes, the S and P is going to retest uh, 4200 and break that uptrend, and that's what we're seeing here. The VIX is now trying to climb above 20, big risk off level. Uh, may, if it finishes higher at the end of the week, I'm going to be a little more worried. Uh, the vol of vol is starting to pick up, so the trend of volatility is now starting to trend back up. Um, that's that's more risk, and then you know Qs are not that bad. This is interesting. S and P volatility is picking up, but check this out. Why aren't it's the Q's? Pretty low, yeah. Why aren't the Q's picking up? And I think yeah. that comes down to, um, I think that comes down to the biggest companies in the S and P have the most cash, stock pickers market, and they can fund their own growth. Exactly, they can fund their own growth here. And so yep. Q's, I know you brought up Asan that Q's are showing a reverse head and shoulders. And I don't know what to make of this. I just think like, hey, Tesla's going to be okay. Um, the, well, probably not in the short term because the market's selling off, but when they bounce, I think they're going to be okay because the UAW is going to crush Ford and GM. Like the prospects for them are, are pretty much done. So yeah. cues are holding on. Like you see the cues. Yeah. That looks pretty bearish, but the cues aren't looking too bad, which is basically just big tech. Um, they need to have a magnificent seven index and just do those. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, but then people wouldn't be investing in the S and P 500 anymore. I know then that they'd, it, yeah, that would be a big divergence, but S and P, I think it's just going to come down and touch this, this uh 200 daily moving average guys. That's what it's looking like. Probably a play from last time. Now, when it comes to inflation, uh, would you say that you think inflation's pretty much done at this point, as far as like systemic it's now recession risk is the bigger issue here versus inflation. Yeah. I mean, I've been talking about that for a couple months, right? So with what the Fed did with the Fed funds rate and how quickly they did it, again, this is just, it's going to take time to hit the markets and do what it needs to do. But uh, historically, the Fed has always overshot what they needed to do. Um, and this is no, no different than every time in history when they tighten, uh, they go too far, um, too fast in this case. Um, and so there will be a pivot for them because they're going to need to with what they've done to the economy. You just haven't seen it yet. Right. And then the re and I agree with you 100 percent. When I look at commodities, I know oil's up. I don't think oil can keep up. I think when the trade ends, it's it's it, the trade ends. And I maybe it does. I don't know. But I don't, I, there's not a whole lot of juice. Maybe there is because people are going to travel. I just don't think there's a lot of systemic juice. Um, for inflation to pick up materially too, because I look at commodities as a le leading indicator. Nat gas is still down, like Nat gas Way is down. down extremely. So energy, you know, energy prices shouldn't be too bad. Uh, that'll offset oil. Copper breaking down now. Copper starting to break down, um, and that's another big, you know, uh, commodity heavy commodity that you got to look for. And then wheat as a proxy for food to some degree, because carbs are in everything. Wheat is breaking down. So the big commodities for me are just making new lows. I think inflation is pretty much done. And now the risk does turn into that recession. Yeah, uh, it does turn into that recession risk. And we're getting closer to it. So uh, let's see triple B spreads. This is oh, it's finally starting to pick up. OK, so this is equity credit, um, equity credit risk, I guess you could say. It is the the spread between treasuries and treasury debt and corporate debt. If it goes up, you're seeing people dump. Basically, you're seeing you're seeing investors dump corporate credit. 
So it's not at bad levels yet. This was this was the banking crisis, so it shot up. Um, maybe we oh, maybe we get a, sh a, a maybe it shoots up again. Either way, I mean, would you say that this ends? This ends in I mean, you you see all the oh, this is going to be worse than 08. This is going to be worse than uh, oh, yeah. the worst recession ever. What are your thoughts on that? That fear mongering. Um, I, I think it's clickbait, uh, fear mongering. But uh, again. Uh, how deep does the recession go? How bad is the economy going to get with what's happened with the Fed and the rate? Um, that's the big question because when you're talking about housing, um, you're talking about economics, supply and demand. We right. still have a very low amount of supply. The only way we see an, an increase in supply is builders build too much, which they're not doing. Um, and then, or you see people start to lose their homes because they can't afford to make their mortgage payments anymore. But we're talking about I would say 95% of the people that currently own a house bought or had their mortgage um, when rates were in the 3% range. So they have very affordable mortgages. Um, they're not going to, they're probably going to be able to weather some sort of storm if the recession hits hard. So you're not going to see them losing homes. Um, you may see a tick up in inventory because people who bought recently at seven or 8%, um, if they lose their jobs, they're probably not going to be able to afford that mortgage because they've been, you know, they, they stretch themselves a little too thin to buy the house. So you could see an uptick in inventory there, but I don't see, I don't see a major crash in housing prices um, without some sort of major economic event that, you know, we're all hurting. Um, right. So, I mean, that's kind of my take on it. And I think that's kind of the, the, the status quo for the entire economy. What what is your do you have a, a a case that the economy doesn't go in recession? I'm a little more bullish on the economy than you are. Is there a case that you see uh we don't let me present to you kind of what I'm thinking too? Okay. All right. So yeah, the consumer is gonna be slowing, but we're headed into a season where they spend, they still keep spending. I think this they're gonna keep spending, they're gonna prolong it. But as they spend it, as we see manufacturing start to pick up a little bit from the fiscal policy, from the fiscal spending. Um, I'm thinking that kind of offsets the weakness in jobs and jobs materially start to pick up in certain areas. The baby boomers, I hear this all the time. I don't know if you're probably not familiar with, uh, what's his name? Ed Yardeni. He says that the, uh, that the, the baby boomers are so flushed with cash. And I know you talked about this last time and said, well, they're, they, they, they're not going to keep spending, but he's saying that they are spending a lot and that kind of keeps services afloat. And all the fiscal spending is going to keep jobs afloat. Therefore, you get a mild recession maybe in Q1 to Q3, and then growth starts to pick back up because jobs never materially collapse. Um, so basically, jobs is the is the parameter here. So jobs never fall off a cliff because the fiscal spending, uh, and then it rotate that fiscal spending rotates back into more jobs where people keep spending. Uh, could that make any sense in your head at all? obviously right fiscal policy has a huge impact on the economy yeah. um we're we're spending more money to try to reinvest it in in bringing more jobs to the us um but uh, and if you're talking q1 q3 yeah um but let's have the conversation about the election what does that do to fiscal policy and fiscal spending um if there's a change in the guard uh there's a lot of unknowns with that um but i don't necessarily agree with the the boomer situation um, just because, again, uh, the boomers kind of are the, the leading indicator of, as to what, you know, is going to happen to the economy in the future because they're the largest, um, you know, population besides now Gen Z and some of the other ge generations. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think for them, as they retire and that retirement income that they're going to be living off of, let's talk about Social Security. Are they going to make Social Security cuts? These are all things that are going to affect the boomers spending. And I think that's something that you have to take into consideration. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty with the boomers, and I really think they're going to be tightening their belts. Um, the the good part about it is, is that many of the boomers who own real estate or who own their own house, um, most of them have their house free and clear. Um, like 60% of um, you know, homes in the U.S. that are owned are owned free and clear. Um, so I think that that helps them through this. Um, but I do think the boomers are going to be tightening their belt just because they have a little bit more financial literacy and they've seen something like this before. I mean, we're talking about 70s and 80s um, with high inflation. 
Um, they all kind of started to prepare for that. And I think they're, they're looking at it as, okay, this, this, there's a lot of uncertainty. So we're going to try to, you know, cut some of our spending. And I don't disagree with, again, the jobs and the fiscal policy pushing jobs. I just don't necessarily see how the government can continue to uh, reinvest in our economy without some sort of repercussion. Okay. I see it. Um, I would say the counter to that would be if something does break, just because like, a uh, banking crisis, you know, people should have lost their deposits and growth should have collapsed. So the question is, will the Fed step in if something breaks? I think that's the better scenario for the economy that actually something does break quickly. The Band-Aid is ripped off versus a slow drain. If this if this yields keep slowly turning up, I mean, that, that's going to hurt. Yeah, that's definitely going to hurt. So we'll see how yeah. that plays out. Now, moving to China. I don't know if you keep up with China. The China data comes. You probably don't trust the China data at all, do you? Nobody does. Come on. <laughs> hey, man, I trust it when it's good for my uh, investments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what they want you to think. Yeah, China, China, man, their, their PMIs are coming out stronger than expected. Um, barely, they're at 50, but who knows, again, if that data is real. I saw a documentary the other day, I had no clue, that they have the most cities that are completely empty. Um, yeah. Real estate, I was like, what? So Yeah, that's why do you think Evergrande's struggling like they are? Yeah, yeah, so they're so that's interesting there. Yeah, I don't know, man. It's global financial crisis. Is this what we're looking at, or just a slowdown? Uh, I've, I've never been here before. I've never seen this. I mean, OA, I had no clues going on. I don't think we, in 2019 also, uh, I think we're headed for that kind of like a, we're slowing down in 2019, but it was mostly the Fed. Um, the Fed turned around from hiking rates. Yep. Yeah. Where, yeah. But, I mean, and they, they went into quantitative easing a lot more. They went into QE right away. Right. Yep. So this time it's like, well, if inflation isn't the issue, are they going to, you know, do you think that they risk saying if inflation isn't the issue as in the next three, four months, right? Are they going to, let's say inflation comes down to 2%. Let's say PC is at 2%. So oil is back down at 80. Do you think that they'll pull the trigger and cut rates or, um, or start QE uh, or, or what is the big factor here? Housing prices is just too elevated. You think housing prices are just way too elevated? Yeah. yeah that's what it is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I think for, for the fed, they're looking at it like, Hey, we want to see how much of what we've done is going to affect the economy and see if we can really keep inflation down around 2% for an extended period of time. You know, they said they want to see a 2% 2, 2 average. Um, that doesn't mean that they want 2% for a month. Um, they want to see inflation at 2% below 2% for an extended amount of time. So they're going to try to keep this where it's at for quite a while, hence why they said they're not going to do anything in 2024. Um, but I still think that uh, something's going to break and they're going to have to pivot um, and they'll pivot. You know, they'll they'll cut rates. They will probably even start quantitative easing, um, maybe to help with kind of people being able to buy homes again. Um, but I think the the issue is housing prices. And I think we're going to see housing prices start to come down a little bit um, just because there's so little demand. I mean, I'm in the mortgage space. Um, we were doing probably 150 to 200 applications a month. Mm -hmm. um, since I've been here, uh, we've done 65 in the last three weeks. So I, I would say about a 50% cut in mortgage applications. Um, and we've got a pretty decent reach when it comes to our clients. So uh, I think demand is a lot demand is down for mortgages more so than I think anybody's really talking about. Yeah. We've seen mortgage applications are down to 20 year, you know, down over from the last 20 years. Um, but I think it actually gets a little bit worse because again, that data is in the past. And as we see more data roll out, you're going to see mortgage demand down even more. Um, so there's going to be less demand for buying houses, um, which you're going to see an uptick in inventory. Um, that those people that have to sell are going to be selling. They're going to be cutting their prices to try to get people to buy the homes. Um, but until you really see a huge uptick in inventory, um, where people have to sell, whether that's because they lost their job and they can't afford their mortgage. Um, and that's really what's going to really see if there's a real estate crash, that's what would be happening. 
Otherwise, it's just going to be uh, more of a correction. Like we've seen, you know, everybody talks about cycles. Every 10 years, you see a 10% correction. We've been in a great housing market for longer than 10 years. Um, but I think that was spurred by the fact that we saw such a huge crash in 2008. So a lot of that growth in housing that we saw over the last 15 years um, was more spurred by the fact that we were gaining back what we probably shouldn't have lost. Um, and so it's more of a normal thing. So, you know, 10, 15, maybe 20% correction in housing prices helps bring back some of the demand. Um, but if something breaks, regional banks, commercial real estate, um, the Fed's going to have to pivot. So we'll see them cut rates, maybe even do some quantitative easing, bring down some of the mortgage-backed securities, um, purchasing those, 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 those securities um, to try to help spur people back into the housing market again. Dang, yeah, you you bring me to a couple or a couple good points. Um, if you look at the Fed's balance sheet, they're not actually selling off ten. Well, no, they are. They're not selling off thirty year rates. Um, they are selling off uh, mortgage backed securities a little bit. So that's a key. That's I'm glad you brought that up. They still have the tools to be able to support certain areas. Now, my understanding, mortgage backed securities is basically debt, right? Just yeah. What what the hell is it? I mean, if you sell off the debt, does that does that because I asked myself this question the other day, I couldn't find the answer. Do uh does does mortgage rates go? Does that push mortgage rates up as they sell off the mortgage backed securities? What's heavier on rates, 30 year or mortgage backed securities? Right. So mortgage backed securities are probably the most important thing when you're looking at mortgage rates. Um, okay. because basically that's the commodity. Um, so when we fund a loan, uh, it is bundled together with a, another large portion of loans that are similar in rate. Um, typically similar in uh, credit rating. Um, those are then bundled up and then sold on the secondary market. And so when they were buying mortgage-backed securities, they were buying those bundles. Um, and so you saw an increase in demand, uh, inventory started to tick down, rates started to drop. So that's what they were doing is they were trying to lower mortgage rates by purchasing those. And that was one of their tools that they decided to use. So as they start to sell their holdings in mortgage-backed securities, they're increasing the inventory, the supply. And so you'll see rates start to tick up. So it's a good way to kind of gauge what the Fed thinks is going to happen or what they want to happen with interest rates um, as far as mortgages are concerned, because they're going to be buying more mortgage backed securities if they want to bring down those rates. Um, the Fed funds rate doesn't have a direct correlation with mortgage backed securities. It's more of just kind of an indicator as to where the Fed wants to target rates on long term debt. And so that's kind of what you're seeing here. Right, because uh, the the rates, thirty year rates, are kind of climbing towards the Fed funds right now to get that yield curve back in sync to where it usually typically is. Uh, bear steepener, though, we'd we'd rather have the uh, the short term drop, like a rock's not happening. Maybe that's what they're trying to do is get the short term to drop, but instead the longs are are moving up because of the situation we're in. Now I was going to ask you, what about the uh, all the apartment builds, all the apartment investment? Does that is there any way? Um, or any scenario where that tor that sort of slows down the weakness in housing uh, because housing is going to impact construction and jobs and stuff like that. I don't even know what, uh, how big or how much of a portion of jobs is construction. I always it's hear, a big I know, portion. It's a big portion. Okay, that's what I thought. So can they just, can't the people, can't the jobs just switch over to the apartments builds? Is that is it the same thing? Is it similar or is it a big <laughs> difference? Very similar. Um, they kind of go hand in you know, foot. Um, as you see uh, residential construction slow, um, you'll see a lot of them move over to the, you know, the, the apartment or the multifamily. The, the thing is, though, that we're talking about adding more supply of housing, right? So that's been the big issue. We've seen a housing shortage. There's not enough homes for people to, to live in um, and at affordable prices. So as they build more apartments, they're going to um, kind of relieve some of that stress on the housing market because there'll be less demand for people buying houses, um, renting houses. So investors won't be investing as much in residential real estate. Um, they may be looking towards you know building or buying apartment complexes. So I think that's another way that we can kind of alleviate some of the pressure on housing prices. Um, and again, you're, you're increasing the inventory for um, residential living spaces available on the market when you're building more apartments. Um, the, the big question is, is that going to meet the, the needs or the demand of the consumer 
Um, and we get back to the whole, you know, scenario, or at least the, the, the phrase, uh, own nothing and be happy. You know, are they building the apartments to rent? Um, and because they're not planning on building more residential real estate for people to buy to actually own, um, or is this just an attempt to, to kind of address the situation, which is, you know, affordable housing for the average American. Okay. So, all right. A lot of unpack there. So even if they built housing for rents, right? Let's say you have a house and you build it to rent out instead of a multifamily, somebody still has to take that mortgage. So it comes back to the banks either way, right? It comes back to the yep. banks holding, uh, really getting hit there. So again, it's probably going to have to be a government program. Maybe the Biden administration is working on that. I swear, dude, I would not doubt it. That's why I'm like, hey, I'm kind of bullish for markets here because it looks really bad, but they're not responding too negative. They love the fiscal. They don't care until you, you know, they don't really, they're, they're just looking at expectations. So I don't think the market's going to care. So you get that divergence possibly. And we still have three months here. You get the, di I, I'm thinking there's going to be more announcements going forward on how to support uh, the mortgage market. Also the U S treasury ever in your lifetime, did you ever see uh, the treasury, I know the, they announced this last year. I'm still waiting for it to happen. They said it would, it would come in June and never came the U S treasury buying back bonds. Have you ever seen that? Oh yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Buybacks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, this is, this is, it's another one of those tools that they like to use. Um, and the treasury has no problem with it. Um, I think it's more just a matter of to what extent, mm -hmm. um, and how it impacts, you know, the economy itself. Yeah, you're right, Scooby Dooby. Scooby Dooby, jump over to the uh, YouTube stream, bro. You be blowing up the stream on there, and your question, your questions are way better over here because you're a pretty smart guy. So I want to hear what you have to say. Okay, so they've done it before. I did not know that. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm an I'm an optimist to some degree. I, I think they're going to figure it out. But the question is, how much pain? How quickly until we actually get there? Uh, I'm I'm guessing you side with. People are going to have to take some pain, move in with their, do you ever say, Hey, people are going to have to move in with their friends, move in with their parents, uh, for a short period of time. Yeah. Before, I mean, actually yeah. I was, uh, doing a series on videos yesterday talking about, you know, if you plan on becoming a homeowner in 2024, 2025, or you want to become a homeowner eventually, um, you may have to, to make some adjustments, um, tighten the belt a little bit, whether that's moving in with parents, um, uh, moving in with friends, sharing the cost. I think you and I talked about fractional ownership. Um, mm -hmm. These are all things that aren't ideal for the U.S. consumer. Um, but if something were to break and we were to see a real hurt on the economy, it's not something that's out of the realm of possibility, especially as the younger generations have accepted that fact. And many of them are okay with, you know, sharing the housing cost with somebody else, you know, renting rooms. Um, it's not the end of the world. Um, but it could be a temporary fix. Um, obviously it's not a long-term fix. Um, but it, it, it could be something that you could do to, to leverage, um, a budget of somehow to put yourself in a position to be able to buy eventually. Okay. Yep. Yeah. You hear that? I mean, I know people are kind of hurting. They're trying to figure it out. Uh, they're betting on crypto. They're betting on Tesla stock going up a lot uh, to fund that growth. Uh, so we'll, I guess we'll see how that, that plays out. Let's take a look at what data we have going forward. We'll transition into that, what data we have going forward before we get to the technicals. Throw you guys' questions out there if you have them. Again, Josh is, has a unique perspective on the market. Coming uh, from a mortgage point of view, I don't see that stuff. I'm looking at the charts. I don't see any of that stuff. So ask, throw in your questions, your comments on there so we know uh, so he knows how to answer that. So let me see. Economic data. Where are we at? Where are we at? Here we go. All right. Let's see what we got going forward. All right. So we are done with Tuesday. Another disastrous day. Job openings. Who would have thought job openings go up? The market crashes. Bad news is still our good news is still bad news bad so news far and, yep. for the market. I remember for a second there, I was like, hey, good news is finally good news. Not really. Uh, the Fed shut that down. The damn Fed shut that down, bro. They're like, if anything good happens, we're going to we're going to cut you down. If anything bad happens, that's good. We should you know, we're going to let that happen. We're going to monitor it. So ADP employment change. This is private employment, uh, as far as I know, or what is this? Is this government employment, or private employment, uh, right? ADP. Yeah. ADP is the, the private sector. What is, is this basically what corporate? 
Yeah. So, you know, obviously ADP is a payroll system, right? So they collect the data that the government doesn't necessarily have access to. So it's just another indicator as to to jobs and things like that. So it's just one of those more, uh, it's not a, it's not a politically run data center as far as collecting the data and, and, and providing it to us. You think it has a little more credibility? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's a small sliver of what it is. I mean, as far as the economy is concerned, but it's right. not terrible, right? Because a lot of the data is straight from, you know, people logging in and clocking in on their payrolls, the jobs that are being created. So I, as far as the private sector is concerned and what it tells you, I think it's it's pretty on point. Okay. Yeah, I would say that too. Because, dude, this is the era of contradictive data. Like, was it, like two months ago, ADP came out super strong. Payrolls came out weak. One week, ADP comes out weak. I thought the ADP always led to what we might see. That is no longer the case. No. That has no longer been the case. So, hey, there you go. Mortgage applications down. Um, mortgage refis up a little bit. People Are are people refining still? Yeah. So, you got to remember, uh, one trillion in credit card debt. People own houses. They have, I think the average homeowner has $264,000 in equity in their home. Okay. Um, so you're probably going to see people, it, it's not necessarily an uptick in refis in the sense that they're paying off their existing mortgages with mm-hmm. new higher interest rates. You're going to see a lot of home equity lines of credit, second mortgages um, being taken out to pay off credit card debt, pay off car loans, do that sort of thing to kind of weather the storm. Um, and I think that's, that's what is the next shoe to drop as far as mortgages are concerned. What the hell? So that refi counts as people taking out another line of credit to, so they can borrow against it and literally just pay off old stuff. Yep. And then create a new, just consolidate the debt in one payment, essentially. Holy crap. Against their home. Damn. That's, that's worse than I thought. Man, we're, who's gonna buy all these? Who's gonna buy all this debt? We'll see how that plays out. All right, S and P Global PMI composite. This, from what I understand, tell me where you're at with this. Uh, maybe I was taught wrong or I learned it wrong. This is kind of uh, global PMIs. So U.S. I'm thinking U.S. manufacturing outside of the U.S. So mm-hmm. if you're like, uh, let me see, your Tesla, you have a you have a manufacturing plant over plant in Europe. Else, yep. yep. Okay, that makes sense. So it kind of tells you how growth's doing over there. Uh, composite is at 50. We're at that tipping point. Are we going lower? Are we going higher? Are we seeing um, growth or not? Are we seeing growth or not? Right. Uh, uh, no, not, we don't want to see composite services, uh, global C- PMI services. I guess those are still down too. Let's go to ISM services for us. This is expected to tick up. Now this is where I think we we're talking about, um, you expected to come down. Maybe not this, these next couple months. Maybe you do. I expected to stick around here, maybe move sideways, uh, I really don't know. I don't have a good gauge on it. I'm just watching the data until, you know, that January, February, maybe March, Q1, 2024. Maybe we start to contract a bit or maybe not. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Uh, I yeah. I mean, services are a huge industry, a huge part of our economy. So I, I don't necessarily see it dropping off the cliff, um, but maybe sideways, maybe a little bit lower. Uh, I don't necessarily think we're going to see it rise. Okay. Yeah. And then employment. I mean, that's key. We'll, we'll see the employment for services pick up. I mean, I was so surprised that manufacturing employment picked up the new orders. Are we getting a switcheroo here where where the manufacturing starts to pick up a little bit and the services uh, start to sell off? That's I guess that's in the cards also. Yeah, I think that that's what the government's hopeful for, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Bring back some of the manufacturing to the U.S. so that we're a little bit less reliant on uh, manufacturing elsewhere. Right, exactly. Especially China with the conflict, you know. Yep, that makes sense. Um, any, by the way, any new news on uh, foreign relations that you've picked up on that might impact us? Uh, trying to think if I saw anything. There's so much data to keep up with. Yeah, and there's so many news outlets anymore, and you, and honestly, you don't know what to trust. You don't. Um, I, yeah, I mean, you still have, you know, Russia and Ukraine. Um, and I think there's a, you have Iran trying to, you know, jack a oil rigs coming at or oil tankers coming out at the sewer, the, the canal. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's just, there's so much going on. And you got to remember when there's conflict on the international scale, 
uh, you'll see a flight to safety. Now, are you seeing that flight to safety yet? No, but there, there could be a good move uh, if something major happens on the global scale. Um, right. which I don't think is out of the question. Um, I don't mm -hmm. think that there's there's a lot of turmoil going on. I mean, you have protests in Poland going on um, because of his, their, you know, their leader's remarks at the UN. So there's just, there's there's a lot of uncertainty as far as the stability in the global. Would you say their leader what? So uh, the Poland, uh, the head of the Polish, he was at the UN, he made a speech and he was talking about how they weren't allowing immigration. Um, there was a lot of anti-Muslim rhetoric. Mm -hmm. um, so there was almost 1 million protesters outside the capital in Poland, uh, you know, kind of anti-establishment. They weren't happy with the remarks um, and that it, was, it wasn't it was in line. They were trying to prove that it wasn't in line with, you know, the people of Poland. Um, okay. But there, there's some, there's some anti-establishment uh, turmoil in Poland right now because of his remarks at the UN. Sounds like that's the uh, that's the new pervade. norm. Yeah, the new norm, anti-establishment, and then the establishment tries to pose as the anti-establishment. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. So, what about this initial jobless claims or the moving average for jobless claims? Has this surprised you that it, or do you just not trust it? Is this? I mean, is it this trustful data right here? The it's it's more very immediate. right. It's so it's very surprising, right? Because mm -hmm. you hear about layoffs, um, job cuts, um, so. I don't know if I trust the data, just period in the story, because I don't necessarily think that that's in line with what I've been hearing on the street. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't necessarily trust that data. Um, maybe the data, again, is so, you know, looking backwards in the in the rearview mirror that it's not keeping up with what's currently going on. Um, and we see revisions and we see the numbers start to, to rise. Um, but you know, you, you can talk to just about anybody and you'll, you'll find somebody or hear of someone who has lost their job. And usually when you start hearing that, that's when you start seeing the jobless numbers click, you know, start going up, but we haven't seen that yet. So I'm not so sure I trust the data as far as the jobless claims are concerned. Okay. That seems to be the narrative. How do you trust the data? What data do you trust? Okay. So that's what we got. We got a Thursday. Not too much tomorrow. I mean, we went over that Thursday. I now the big day is going to be Friday. Friday, Friday is the Friday. big job. Every yep, first first Friday of every month, right? Yep, jobs first Friday of every month. Just put that in your pocket as a concept because obviously you're not going to look at the whole calendar, guys. So just try to memorize first Friday of every month. Um, I think it's the first month or well, the first week you're going to get the PMI data typically, mm -hmm. and then the first Friday you get that employment data. And uh, non, so this is the question: What the hell is going on here? These non-farm payrolls uh, are they going to be higher, lower? Unemployment at this point so confusing. It's up, it's down, it's down, it's up. Um, whack a mole here. Uh, are we at? Do we trust the data pretty much with this? Also, I mean, you know that they're going to revise previous numbers lower, um, and uh, I wouldn't expect it to to miss the mark by too much. And mm -hmm. I think that's just because that's what everybody's expecting and that's what they're going to give us. But then the following month, you're probably going to see a, a revision lower. All right. What about this labor participation? Do you think people are coming in the labor force? I do. You do? Okay. I do. Th that doesn't contradict, though, like job loss. I always thought about that. Like if people are coming in, isn't that why initial jobless claims are not really picking up because there's more people coming in? Or where, what am I missing there? So I think what we're missing is we haven't seen uh, the labor force lose the baby boomers yet. They're holding on a little bit longer. Um, so as you see more of the younger generations enter the labor force, um, you're going to see that number continue to tick up. But as the boomers start to phase out, uh, you're going to see a shift in that paradigm. Okay. And then so wages we have here, Scooby-Doo, we say, uh too many just too many jobs that need to be filled the problem is that wages are way too low um is that the case so we should see wages tick up i mean what california bumped them up um, work at mcdonald's you're gonna make 20 dollars an hour in california yeah work at mcdonald's and then fly fly to what idaho and play pay your bills no i'm just kidding right uh, <laughs> If you could afford it, but, yeah. um, dang, yeah, that's crazy. So wages. So it's kind of like that wage inflation is it back on the table. 
Uh, and then immigration, though, also, right? Didn't Biden just do, work visas for Venezuelans, which would yep. ease wage pressures, right? So it's like, yep. I hear, of course, on the on the right, it's like, that's terrible. We're going to bring in more criminals, which probably is true to some degree. Yeah. But is it worth getting wages, you know, getting wages under control, getting people back in the workforce? Um, how, how does that come? Does, how, what do you know about that? Does that come into play right away? Like the the whole work visas how long does that take to actually convert into the economy if happens? so a lot of those work visas are going to be issued right away um they're going to be looking for jobs they're going to take those jobs at a lower uh pay scale compared to you know the u.s consumer so i think that's it has a, a pretty quick impact um and if we're looking for higher wages for employees uh this could be the the, the thing that keeps that from happening i think i lost you jeremy yeah, I did. Well, um, I'll hang on a little bit and I'll wait for him. But, you know, to your question, as far as uh, the immigration and what it does to the, the markets, um, it's going to fill a lot of those jobs that aren't ready to be picked up by the U.S. You know, worker because the wages aren't good enough for them. So um, you see a, a, a pullback on wage inflation with that simple fact. And that's what I think the administration is looking to do um, with those work visas. Um, but again, if we're demanding higher wages for the U.S. worker, um, it's going to be hard to, to get those if, you know, the, the immigration is going to fill those jobs that typically, you know, you could get filled with the U.S. worker, um, but they are unwilling to take it because of the pay. It just seems like an impossible job. You're trying to get wages up for people, but then you're bringing people in that's going to lower wages. What the hell is going on here? This is why I think it's a stock picker's market for the stock guys because the economy is just all over the place. It's good. It's going to favor the best. I, that's what all I think is it's just going to favor the best. Um, I've never asked you, Josh, what uh, if you did have to, you know, get into some stocks, what companies are you in, do you ever do individual companies or are you more like an index guy what would you invest in i'm a definitely an index guy i like to kind of spread everything over a little larger piece of the pie um but i i i agree with um arc and kathy wood on tesla i mean that's just the innovation and if they can automate uh, especially the the larger trucks uh for moving uh goods that's I mean, that's a, that's a, a money maker. Then you start thinking about the automation when it comes to rideshare. you know, no longer do you need Uber and Lyft, you have cars and you can employ an entire fleet of cars to go around driving people to their destinations like taxis. Um, right. so the, the entrepreneur who's able to buy up as many of those Teslas that are automated, um, and create a fleet. I mean, that's, that, that could be the, the future of taxi service. So, I mean, there's so much uh, growth potential there. I, I, I love Tesla in that regards. Nice, nice. Well, hey, put your money where your mouth's at. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no pressure. Right? Wait, waiting for that big drop, huh? That's what everybody's waiting for uh, that I know that's in real estate. They're waiting for the big drop, which typically could happen. I mean, it's, it is what it is. The scary part is for, no, not scary for me. But what I always say is, well, if the Magnificent Seven ripped to the all-time highs, and then the market does start to barf in like Q1 and Q2. They might not barf as much, nearly as much. They might just keep going. I've seen it before happen. Yeah. And uh, and then it's like, oh, okay, well, now I got to buy the index and I got to wait. And those things ran away from me. But if you're just a stable person, you're not like, I need to be high on high price. Like, you know, if you're that, that's not me. I need to see high growth. I want I want a, a beautiful story. I want to see a, an explosion to the upside. If you're, if you're not looking for that, it doesn't really matter. Um, no. But eventually, I'm going to sell you, Josh, on on Chainlink, on CCIP. As, as you've already sold me, man. Like <laughs> I, 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 I think that is the future of you know global finances. I mean that you know you had the internet and what it did and how they linked all the different internets throughout the countries. This is the future of global finance. This is yeah. This is the future, man. I. Uh, it's funny because a lot of the crypto guys. They hate it that it would yeah. be right now. They right, hate it because it's going to connect them to the other uh, cryptos. And then you're going to see price comparisons like, OK, so is this really worth that or is it worth this? And so you're going to have to have exchanges and those exchanges are going to 
either devalue or value the crypto that you're in. So uh, that interconnectivity um, really takes away from the isolation that you see in certain cryptos. And so uh, depending on where you're at and who you are, you know, you want your exchange to be higher so that, well, you know, your, your investments work a lot more. So that's going to, I think, normalize it a little bit more, stabilize it a little bit more. Um, but again, it's, it's going to hurt some of the crypto exchanges because of the fact that they're not as valued. Exactly. Yeah, you're, you're right. And, and two, a lot of the use cases, number two, a lot of the use cases don't matter anymore. Once you get this interconnected, this and that, like those use cases are not real. Or, I'm sorry, they don't really matter. It's kind of like you're, you're, you know, it's kind of like you're using Yahoo search and then Google comes along with Google search and they add all these features. So what they used to do is obsolete. They can't keep up with the changing marketplace. Therefore, Yahoo just falls. The stock keeps falling. And that's even the close comparison. These guys aren't even close. Like they're not even no. close to interoperating. So that's that's a big one there. And, uh, you know, I'm watching these YouTubers who are like crypto veterans. And they're so shocked because they've been crapping on Chainlink for so long. And they're so shocked. There's this, uh, there's this YouTube channel called uh, Bankless. I watched them back in the day. They're called Bankless. And they were so shocked interviewing the the, the guy who started at Sergey Nag Nagzaroth. I mean, it's right now it's about to get super political too because they're pissed off. The Bitcoiners, what? You're you're connecting the trad fight? Like, bro, where do you think the money's going to come from? How exactly. do you connect? You think you're going to really uh, have a separate system from the whole yeah. global financial system? No, it's not. Nope. That's not how it works. It's I mean, that was when this all started, I think somebody asked me, so, you know, what do you think about crypto? I'm like, it's a great concept. The problem is that eventually it's going to have to be globalized. It's going to have to have some sort of market um, where it can be exchanged. And when that happens, there's going to be, you know, a, a kind of a, a watering down of the value of it just because of the exchange itself. Um, so I think until that happens, it's not something that's going to be widely used, but I do think it's the future. Um, and I like the concept behind the crypto, especially because of the fact that you do have a limited number of, you know, coins available, which is like backing it with gold. Uh, right. you know, the U S dollar, it's no longer a fiat con currency that can just be printed and we can burn through it. There's a limited number. Um, now the question is, how does the federal government get into this so that they can be a part of the crypto world so that they can adopt it in the United States? That's the caveat to the CBDC, some of the other things that they're trying to do. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, how do they bring that to market for everybody to use uh, federal government right. manipulation in that regards? Right. So well, CC, I mean, that, 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 that helps them in that regards because now it does, can, yeah. You and this say, is here's our here's our CBDC. Here's how much it's worth compared to, to Bitcoin. Now we can exchange it. Now we have more Bitcoin, so they can start leveraging it, and it 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 works. Yeah. So so and a lot of people get confused about this, and this is why again it's so bullish because Scooby Dooby. I love when you respond. He says uh, Tesla cut margins. They're going to go lower. Basically, blah blah blah. Um. Yeah, but they're gaining market share. Come on, let's use common sense, Scooby Dooby. UAW is going to UAW is going to collapse Ford and GM. That revenue is going to start going into Tesla because the prices are slower. It's a long game for Tesla. I know you don't agree, but again, common sense tells you the lower prices are. If you're looking at two, uh, if you're looking at two cars and one's cheaper and one performs better, you're going to buy the one that performs better and is cheaper. That's just common sense. Yep. Number one, number two, 99% of cryptos are pure grifts. 100% agree with you, and they're pissed off now because. Uh, going to be compared most, to the rest. Most of them aren't going to work. Okay. Number three, CCIP. Check this out. The uh, DTCC, which is literally the depository settlement for the U.S. This is the depository settlement uh, committee or uh, basically corporation for the U.S. for the Fed. Um, they they basically filter every equity transaction, every treasury, mortgage-backed security, any securities transaction. They filter, and what did they choose? CCIP there. So the government's all, the U S is already, already using, using it. it, you know, yep. they're experimenting with it today. So they're literally telling you what they're going to choose. And it's not that they're choosing the coin to buy. They're choosing the, uh, the, the protocol to use. And the thing is it builds revenue because with every transaction, you know how it works. It takes a piece of that to run it right. Cheaper, faster. Yep. So CCIP, honestly, the opportunity 
I mean, it's it's the next Bitcoin for a lot of people that'll say it's the next Bitcoin, but it's not like Bitcoin. It's totally different. No. What it is, is it's something that in sh that is going to be backed by the global financial system and they're all using it and you can see the revenues online and it's not owned by anybody. Also, it's also decentralized at the same time. So it connects those forces. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that, that the government's already using it. Swift is the messaging system for the for the whole uh, financial system on the dollar side if you're using dollars so no it's not competing with the dollar uh scooby dooby crypto cri people don't understand what crypto <laughs> is it's like talking about internet internet it's like saying internet is going to be defeated by amazon at aws there's a, it's the mm -hmm. same thing like same thing you're interconnected there it's just what specific applications are going to win and which ones are going to lose right which applications that's where it's at the war is at the application layer so Anyways, getting back to it, yeah, that's that's kind of it. That's why I'm like, bro, are uh, is this like what's going on here? They're they're literally choose oh the CBDC is also the U.S. is already working on the CBDC. Uh, who knows what the White House is doing about it? But again, to to make a CBDC, um, what you do is you have a private blockchain. You have a private blockchain here, and uh, the problem is private blockchains don't want to use XRP. They don't want to use uh, Bitcoin. They don't want to use that blockchain. They want to be able to uh, to to plug into those blockchains and they cannot do that they can't even plug into each other so if there's a u.s central uh cbdc they can't connect to china and i'm just using china because it's going to happen they can't connect to the uk's they can't connect to the imf's uh blockchain they can't do that so ccip allows them to literally connect with those blockchains um without them taking any risk and then now transact right between yep. banks and then also plug into crypto so they can benefit from the crypto uh, applications at the same time. That's why it's big. It's not a blockchain. It's a technology that helps blockchain, whether it's crypto, private, or public, uh, or well, that is public, or uh, blockchain uh, for the public. So it's it's really, you can't lose here. I mean, you always say that, and then the price drops like 50%, but I don't think people are really going to get this until they see the price. It's always price movement. Once prices explode, then they're interested. Uh, so we're just letting them know, letting them know now, not let, I'm not no guru. I'm just trying to recapitulate the information like, hey, here's the opportunity you've been waiting for. Uh, cut your expenses, go live with your, your, you know, 10 friends, invest, be smart. Don't buy dumb stuff. Buy some chain link. No, I'm just kidding. No, yeah. no financial advice here. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think we covered everything. Um, I don't want to take more of your time, Josh, but we're going to for for my guys that want to see the charts, we're going to jump into the charts and uh hey i appreciate you coming on man hey i appreciate you having me man you have a lot of wisdom so keep it up and again when we get some more information guys we'll schedule it up we'll jump on here and talk through it so tonight because these are really confusing waters i don't know everything uh josh really good insight there so again thanks shout out hold on before you go josh let me make sure yeah, this yeah. Works. let me make sure okay. this works. all right here we go all right there we go yeah there we go shout out to you all right man take it easy all right, brother. have a good day man all right you too all right, we'll get to the we'll get to the charts now. Um, let me get through the rest of your guys's comments here. Well, it's really Scooby Dooby. The dollar will continue to be king. Yes, it will for the fiat currencies. It's not like backing it with gold. Backing it with gold would be backing it with gold. No, because you can't transact with gold. Uh, Bitcoin, you can transact. You can transact with Bitcoin, so it's totally different. But Bitcoin is not gold until it's the future gold. It's not gold until the volatility slows down uh but for bitcoiners it is it is gold now you can't debase bitcoin bitcoin's going nowhere okay scooby dooby you're confused you have no clue what you're talking about when it comes to bitcoin or ethereum or chainlink you don't you haven't done the research you don't understand it for the other 99% of cryptos most of them you're right you're right a lot of them won't have a, a real use case uh, some of them will, but they won't have a use case. But for the most part, I don't think you understand how Bitcoin works. Um, you just say random stuff. I'd love to have you on here in real time. Let's do let's do a debate, bro. Come on, let's do an actual debate on Bitcoin, so we can straighten this out. You you probably have better arguments against Tesla. Uh, anyways, crypto's only use is manipulation for the commodities or futures. They're they are using the code, not the coin. Still got the problem that crypto doesn't have a navy to ensure the flow of good. Crypto, crypto, you're confused. With, that's like saying the internet doesn't work because it doesn't have a navy. That's not that. That's not really compatible. Crypto is, crypto is a. It's it's just like talking about social media. Social media doesn't have an army. It doesn't mean it can't grow. It's not competing against the U.S. dollar at all. 
that's competing against assets in general. Uh, gold gold spends worldwide. I do I do understand it. That's the issue. No, you do not understand it. You understand some of it, maybe, but I don't think you really understand it. Um, anyways, yeah, let's do that debate, Scooby Dooby. Let me know when you want to do it. Um, the U.S. ensures the flow of goods globally and has for decades. The U.S. doesn't compete against crypto, bro. You're comparing apples and oranges here. Crypto is not competing against the U.S. It's like the internet. This is how I know you don't understand it. The internet, everybody uses it. China, Japan, it's a protocol. Crypto is is just a word for cryptographic technology, right? It doesn't mean the applications are all going to work, but it's literally like the internet. The, in, the internet is not competing against the dollar. It's not competing against stocks. It's They use it. Everybody's going to use the internet. They're all going to use crypto to some degree. Not all crypto, not all internet applications work. Not all internet applications actually are, are valuable at all. So there's a couple of them, right? There's a couple of them. And that's where your comparison is wrong. Crypto isn't a thing. It is a technology. It's a layer of technology, right? So anyways, let's have that debate. Um, Tesla's going to take over the taxi fleet by themselves and run the taxi business. 100%. I agree with you. Shout out to uh, shout out Apple. How's it doing? Yeah, let's let's look at the charts. We we went over a lot of the macro. The macro is super confusing right now. Uh, I I still think we're gonna have an end year year end rally. I think the the market is looking at. Let's look at the charts. Uh, is looking at that two hundred daily moving average. Me mark the time. We're at one twenty. Okay, we're gonna do about ten minutes. Actually, I'll go through all your questions. We'll do that first, and then uh, we'll we'll be done with the technicals. We went over the macro. Um, I'll give you my deep over. You know my over. Uh, extreme um outlook on the market uh where are we at with the charts here let's go let's go let's go look at to these charts that's what we want to see um let me widen this out all right dang the queues still have a way to go for that 200 daily moving average um it's more comparable to the beanie babies i heard that one before it's a weak argument you'll get destroyed you're gonna get destroyed scooby Dooby, on that the beanie babies um okay all right, um, Apple. So let's take a look at Apple. First, before we get to Apple, let's look where, where's the market at. Let's take a look at where that market's at. We already know, okay, short-term rates, not really moving. Long rates, exploding rate risk, right? That's 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 a problem. Bonds getting destroyed. DXY going higher. The macro forces are not in our favor. They're definitely against us. The thing is, they're. I think they're close to capitulating. They're going to get, bro, they can't keep going up. They're, they Could they go up further over the next three months? Sure. But they're going to retrace, and that's going to be the bottom for the S and P in the in, in the intermediate, and we go from there, right? We got to get the bounce now. Yes, we did have that bounce earlier. This is SPX. We did have that small bounce, but it wasn't a bounce back into the trend, right? So it's still oversold. I need to see. We need to see the oversold. Actually, look at that. That thing is breaking. We need to see the oversold actually bounce significantly to the upside and then roll over. That would be confirmation of further weakness. But what we're seeing is we're still oversold. We're still, the sellers are becoming exhausted. They're going to become more exhausted. Why? Because they're going to collect profits here. Going into the 4,200 level, they're going to they're gonna take profits. You, they're not stupid. They're not going to keep shorting um, unless there's some kind of break. They're not going to keep shorting. They're going to take profits. They're going to re-examine, okay, where do we get short again, right? It's probably going to be back at this level at 434 where they got resisted. For, you know, this is where they're going to short again. So we need to get above this level and hold. Uh, but anyways, they're going to cover. So that's what we're really headed into the 200 uh, daily moving average. That's kind of the big. Now, NDX, same thing, right? NASDAQ looks not as bad as the S&P. And uh, it's pulling into that 200 daily moving average, which was also the previous support back here. So that's all. That's where we are. We're oversold. We're gonna bounce at some point, right? Um, and and when I say bounce, a meaningful bounce, not a little one day bounce. Like we're gonna start shooting up higher, and everybody's gonna get excited, and then we say, okay, well, we need to pull back and then uh, find the find our footing there, right? Now let's go to Apple. Also, the how many stocks move? Look at this. This is making the low from March. This is so oversold. This is more oversold than it was in March. How many stocks are moving below the 50-day moving average, which means market breadth is absolutely getting destroyed at the moment. Okay, market breadth is getting destroyed. Apple, what does it look like? I haven't even looked at Apple. Wow, Magnificent 7. I bet you're better doing good. Yeah, we'll get to BTC. Uh, Apple still in that trend. Here's the thing, guys, that you got to understand. 
Rate risk is a problem. Don't get me wrong. It, it poses risks for the economy, uh, specifically banks, regional banks, not big banks, regional banks, specifically commercial real estate. Does Apple give a damn about commercial real estate? No, it doesn't. It does not. Why? Because they locked in rates at low levels until 2025. I mean, sorry, 2027 till 2030. They don't have rate risk right now, right? These Magnificent Seven, and I put this on my Twitter, the Magnificent Seven and others too, not just them, but companies who were pretty responsible, they locked in low rates and have a lot of cash. They can just take that cash, park it at the money market funds, fund their own debt because their debts are what? Two and a half, three percent uh, interest payments and uh, the money market funds giving them what? Five percent. So they're not they're not really at risk here. It's more so they're going to react to the macro inflation, the Fed, X, Y, Z. But they're going to bounce. We're headed into earnings season also. And the question is, are have earnings troughed? Have they bottomed out? And I think they have. So we're pulling into that. We bounce by the time we get to the top of the trend for Apple, right? The the breakdown for Apple looks like looks like we want to get here, right? We want to get above this level and then break to the downside. But we're oversold. I'm pretty let me see. I haven't seen Apple. Apple was oversold back here, had a nice bounce. We're still pretty much oversold. So uh, when we get to the top here, this level, the resistance right now for Apple is going to be about 180. 180 is really where you say, okay, if we can't get above 180, uh, we're at risk of making a new low for Apple. I can never find my, 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 uh, where is it? There we go. Uh, 180. So yeah, I would say 180 is the real risk for Apple here. Um, if we can get above 180, that's the breakout. That's the breakout zone. We're pulling into that 200 daily moving average. We've been pretty much oversold. Doesn't look too bad. Okay. So, uh, market really retraced, but look, all the weakness, Apple still holding up over the past one, two, three, four, four, four or five days. <coughs> what does that tell you? That there, there is demand for Apple stock. There is demand for this stock. Okay. Uh, next, um, BTC holding relatively strong. To the text, yeah. BTC doesn't even care right now, and I think because long term hodlers are hanging in there, uh, Bitcoin doesn't care about rate risk. R rate risk is going up, it is going to pressure BTC, but it's not really. And that's oh, it's getting resisted against the 200. Some people argue it doesn't matter because the BTC moves 24 hours a day, so therefore the 200 moving average isn't a good measurement because it's always moving 24 7. This measures five days a week, uh, BTC seven days a week, right. So who knows? Maybe it is right. Either way, uh, not a big negative reaction there for Bitcoin still on trend. Um, I mean, this is not I'm not talking about trading here, but for the most part, Bitcoin materially isn't going to get crushed unless uh, you have like an FTX collapse, unless you have unless you have a, an exchange really collapse, unless Binance has to sell all their Bitcoins. But at this point, a lot of people are levered in They're They're looking forward to the ETF. Uh, that news is, you know, 24 seven, maybe we consolidate for another three months um, until, you know, March, who knows? Either way, 25K solid level for Bitcoin. And this is market cap, by the way, this is just looking at the market cap, right? And then we got, uh, can you check QQQ? I made a head and shoulders pattern, not inverse uh, on the daily left shoulder at 616 head on. Okay, 616. Look at that head and shoulders. Okay, so you're looking here, 616, right? So this is, let's, let's blow this up. This is the head and shoulders you're talking about. Um, all right, there's your shoulder. Is this your, oh yeah, that's your head right there. My bad, I was gonna, I was gonna do it a different way. So shoulder, head, bro, brush, shoulder. Okay. So you're breaking down now. Yeah, you are, you are starting to play out now. Um, I think it's headed for, if it does break down, it's headed for that 200 moving average. So that'd be a nasty breakdown for, for cues, but keep in mind, well, I guess the cues do have a little more room. So we could break down if we get under, 352 and the s p is still falling um that's going to be an issue but right now the s p and the q's look completely different as in s p is already really sold off it's it's already in overextended territory to the downside and it's also headed for the 200 so i think we get a bounce on the s p first which means the q's the q's should see a bounce first 
Now, if the S&P cannot hold the 200, then the Qs do not hold this level and the Qs probably retrace back to the 200 daily moving average, right? And hey, keep in mind, the the macro forces are against us. So this is this is, you know, this is probably more likely the scenario if they continue to pressure to the upside. Um right now for the short side anyways, uh for the short term, we could see yields reverse, we could see, you know, 30 year yields reverse, we could see the that's going to cause the dollar to reverse, oil staying sideways, kind of selling off. Um that would be constructive for the market. But we're in the red zone. We're in the negative zone, right? We're in a uh, risk off zone right now for the market. 200 moving is at uh, about 240. The 200, would you say the 200 is at 240? You mean, wait, 240? You talking, are you talking 340? Well, I am on trading view. Let me make sure this is correct. Maybe I have this wrong. No, that's a 200 on trading view. Uh, the weekly, I mean, the weekly moving average is way down there. I'm trying to see where you're getting 240 from. No, that's not 240. Yeah, I don't know where you're getting 240 from unless your moving average is different. Okay, 340. So, and you're talking, uh, you're probably talking the Qs, right? 340 on the Qs um, daily. Let's go to the daily. Why not be in the Qs? The Qs are the only index that outperforms the Fed balance sheet anyway. Uh, so you have it at 340. Mine's at, that's weird. Mine's at a, mine's here at 330. So who knows? They're they're tricking us. That's the market playing against us. Either way, 340 is another support also, right? Where you're right at this previous uh, resistance. So we'll see if that turns into support. Okay. Um, see, I traded carbides. I traded shout out carbides. I traded spy right before the close. I saw a falling wedge reversal on the five to ten minute right at the end. Swung call for a swung calls for fun. Did we get that reversal? We were on the we were talking macro. I didn't even see it. Uh, I'm also watching VWAP from the highs. Uh, I think this is the fact that we've came down so far. We're not going to bounce very strong. We bounce, but it's going to take time. I think it's going to take all of October to get past employment report, CPI. It's going to take all of October to actually get past, uh, to get back above this trend, to break back above, right? If we do, right? If we do. I think we're going to have a, a Santa Claus rally, and I'm going to come out with that video. I'm going to give you all my evidence for it. I still think we have a Santa Claus rally, maybe not in all stocks, obviously, but the Qs, big tech, because they can fund their own growth. These rates are not affecting uh, these big stocks, right, to some degree, um, and the dollar is going to ease at some point. So what are we looking at here? What, uh, what was I even talking about? Oh, SPY. All right. Let's take a look at that really quick. And then what do we got here? Stock market is rigged. I mean, sure. Never heard anybody give a crypto actual use case for any. Yeah, well, the meme coins don't have use cases. Everybody in crypto knows that. I will say in crypto's only real use case is manipulation for the commodities futures market. Okay. Well, okay. Goldman is selling energy and buying big caps. Oh, I like that. Goldman selling energy and buying big caps. Really? That sounds good. Um, I could see that energy is overextended. Um, big caps, they want to get back in because they can they can still benefit from this uh, you know, very high rate environment. I don't think inflation is going to be a big issue going forward. For consumers, yes, but big caps, they don't need consumers. A lot of them don't need consumers. They're getting fiscal spend, they're getting money market fund liquidity, and they are growing at a fast pace and they're doing innovative technologies. Uh, Binance going to be the match that burns all crypto. If Binance collapses, yeah, I'd agree. Pay attention to the retail sales. Kroger sounded the alarm the other way. Yeah, they did. I mean, people are moving too. They're they're moving from um, they're moving away from certain retailers like Nike or certain. They're, they're just rotating their spending. They're rotating their spending. So we'll see this Christmas spend how it really goes. Okay, carbides. You said that you. Five to ten minutes right at the end. Okay, you got this reversal then. I'm guessing. Right? Double bottom here. Um, broke the trend. Maybe back above VWAP. Where's our VWAP at? Oh, we didn't even get above VWAP today. If that's VWAP. 
So that was right into the close, huh? You got this break at 420. And look at 420 is the big, big level, right? 420 is the, the low level, I think, for SP. Let's double check here. 420 is where we broke out on the last, basically the breakout area. Yeah, 420 was the last breakout area. So if we kind of uh, zoom in here, let's take VWAP off. We zoom in here when we gapped up, right? It was like 422. So we can't, oh, we got below that gap. Yeah, we so 420 is about right here. That's insane. We were traced all the way back. I keep saying this is the low, but we got bad news. We got some bad news. Any any uh any little bit of good news? What the hell is going on? Any bit of good news? We're going higher. Okay, maybe not for longer, but we're gonna we're gonna bounce at some point, and then we can take a breath. Don't get sucked up in shorting. Not shorting. Uh, you could short this, of course, if you're day trading, but we're at we're at support. Okay, we're at support. We're gonna bounce, and the, the really the threat to the bull market is after we bounce, do we roll over again? That's gonna be the real threat in my view. Uh, if you get that RSI start to make lower highs uh, on big retracements to the upside. We need to get past all the data. Yeah, we need to get past all the data. Uh, so, hey, this was a big pullback. There's a lot of risk. But remember, you know, keep your eye. I always say this. Keep your eye on the 10-year the yield, right? It is break. This is literally what's going on, guys. This is the issue. 10-year yield is tightening financial conditions for the Fed, right? The dollar breaking over 106. This was my risk off. I'm like, hell no, right? Mega caps are sticking in there a little bit because the rate risk isn't that bad for the mega caps, but it is crushing the rest of the market, right? And there's probably going to be some ch uh, some charts that we see going forward where it shows the divergence uh, going forward. So the market is back to normalization, really high rates uh, in, the, in the bond market, right? But we have a lot of progress on inflation. We saw the, the PCE data month over month was at 1%. So inflation is, I don't want to say it's solved, but inflation is making a lot of progress here. Okay, it's making a lot of progress uh, minus uh, oil prices, right? Now, oil prices, whatever, that's going to tighten the consumer. That's going to bring inflation down even, even lower. People are going to spend less. There's no commodity risk, right? Copper, natural gas, wheat, those things are collapsing. So what does that tell you? Commodity inflation is not there. The VIX is back above 20. Um, well, it touched 20, came back down. Watch that trend. Here's the downside. <gasps> VIX is materially, uh, the VIX is the VIX, the volatility of the VIX is grinding higher. And when it does start to grind higher, that's not a good sign, right? That is not a good sign. I would say once we get above this 0.2, then I'm a little worried. We got the 200 moving average, not to say that even matters. We'll see if it finds a floor here uh, over the next couple of weeks. Here's the constructive part NASDAQ vol is not really spiking the way, uh, you know, SP vol. So this is going to be a stock picker's market in my view. The, the the Santa Claus rally is going to come from the best performing assets, right? The best performing, the best balance sheets, the best margin expansion, the most revenue, the most demand. That's where it's going to come from, right? Whoever can be very efficient. Bond volatility, making new highs, not good. This is a big risk. Uh, this, this might cause uh, KRE to roll over. KRE is rolling over at the moment. This is commercial real estate slash, well, KRE is not commercial real estate, but we're talking commercial real estate slash regional banks, big risk to them. They probably collapse, right? Not collapse like, oh, financial crisis, but the Fed will step in at some point. Credit risk is finally starting to step up. So we're getting some issues here. Put to call ratio, that probably goes up over this next couple of weeks. Things are uh, very scary right now. Uh, junk bonds. Okay, this is credit risk. Junk bonds are barfing. Okay, this is not good for the stock market because people are, are are selling or or basically the debt for that the the underlying debt for the for for the market is starting to barf. Okay, HYG junk bonds not looking good. Yield curve is inverting, but it's a bear steepener because it's inverting because short rates are not falling, long rates are going higher. So it's inverting in a bear steepener. Obviously S&P is coming down there. Biggest negative sectors are literally look at home builders. Home builders are still uh, pulling into that 200. They're not too well. They're they're getting smashed. Let's just keep it real. XLE, uh, commercial real estate getting smashed. XRT getting smashed. So it looks pretty bad there. It looks really bad. But we're oversold. So I'm still waiting for this bounce. I think we're gonna get it. Um, maybe the best thing is KRE rolls over. Unfortunately, you know, RIP for those guys holding KRE. 
uh, this thing collapses and the Fed steps in again. Fed net liquidity picks up. Guess what? Today, Fed net liquidity did step up. We got the Fed liquidity step up. If we look at the reverse repo liquidity, the shadow QE, that is also uh, stepping up. Where is it at? And we're waiting for this balance sheet to pop. Where is it? Is the damn balance sheet at, bro? It's annoying. Anyway, um, global liquidity having a little bounce here. Okay, so there's still, you know, it's not, it's not too dire. Where's the, where's the RRP facility? Did I put it over here? No. Okay, let's look, let's look for it here. Let's just add it on here. All right, there we go. So the reverse repo facility or the shadow QE still picking up. I'm going to turn it white. We've been looking at it white. We'll keep it white. Um, shadow QE, that's not it. Bro, where, what's going on with my... Oh, there it is. Okay. So shadow QE still picking up. So there's still some support from... Uh, there's still some liquidity support coming in. Invert it. There we go. Right. Still, you still got liquidity and this is two year yields. That's why they're not falling. Two year bonds are not falling because these are eating the two year bonds. Let's invert this back up. What you got up here, Carver? The VIX is also highly susceptible to noise from traders. I wish you couldn't trade the VIX. OK, um, I don't I don't even know about the VIX right now. Um, it could be you're saying basically that. People are just getting long VIX, so it's not really that great of a signal. Um, I would agree with that. I mean, it, it gives you a signal, but it doesn't tell you the full story, right? Um, it does not tell you the full story. I'm most worried when liquidity is no longer coming in from the RRP, which might drain supposedly by 2024. We'll see how that bakes in. Uh, what else do we have to, uh, seeking out lower prices at Walmart? People are only... Dang. Pay attention to the retail sales. Okay, we got that. People are only buying essentials okay also they are seeking out lower prices at walmart and aldi 100 oh aldi has lower prices i got an aldi right next to me i'm gonna have to go check out they had some good salsa last time i went i love salsa i'm half mexican um what else we got on here we'll keep looking at the charts i'm gonna go over tesla i'm surprised that we haven't seen a crash yet people change their eating habits in the spring um i mean that's not gonna crash the market because people trade you know, change their eating habits. I think what's going to crash the market is a very big black swan event. Surprise, right? Not necessarily change their eating habits. Small caps. Yeah, small caps are getting right. Look, there is a crash in the market. It's just the big Magnificent Seven are holding up the market still. A couple other stocks. But for the most part, a lot of stocks are getting smashed. They're getting smashed pretty nasty. Markets have been so bad. Yeah, they've been bad. But remember, we're coming from a high area. Here's the thing. To keep in mind, you know, a lot of people get recency bias, including myself. We're all susceptible to it. But keep in mind, right, that let's look at the Qs here. We came from very low levels. Like the S&P, the Qs almost touched all-time highs. They're still, you know, from the lows, we're still up 38%. Are you kidding me? I mean, the Qs were up, what, 50%? That's insane from the lows up 50 percent right so is this really that bad or is it that we're just retracing that we're consolidating sideways if you take a you know take a step back here and i'm not trying to convince you that there's going to be only a bull market i'm just saying uh i'm just trying to give you some perspective here look where we're at we're really just kind of trading sideways right that was that previous support pre-pandemic uh no not pre-pandemic pre uh qt pre-qt we're kind of just moving sideways in this area. If we break lower, I'll be a little more worried, but we're at those levels. And if we go to S&P, maybe S&P is actually broken lower. Yeah, S&P is broken lower. There's a lot of weakness in S&P, uh, obviously. So we're, you know, we're, we're, we're still sideways. I mean, the, the, bear, the bull market trend is definitely broken, though, for the S&P. It's, it's, it's been breaking. So I'm like, okay, last line of support is at 200 moving average. If we jump to SPX, I think it looks a little different. Uh, it's it's pretty much at the trend. 
it's at the trend. So we'll see how that plays itself out. Uh, Fed liquidity is going to bring this up. That's global liquidity. That's starting to pick up a little bit. Uh, RRP liquidity is picking up. Fed balance sheet. Why isn't it showing up on here? That pisses me off. Fed balance sheet. Um, wall clave. That is still retracing. So this is still diving, nose diving too. Uh, that's QT. That'll probably keep nose diving. Can you bring up a Schiller PE ratio chart and comment? Uh, Schiller PE ratio chart. Is it on the indicators or is it, uh, let me see, is it a indicator? Actually, let me throw it over here. Schiller, I've never looked at this. Schiller PE, let me make sure I get this right. Schiller PE ratio chart. Where's where's this at? Don't think it's an indicator. Um, well, where do I find it? Where do I find the Schiller P ratio chart? Do I just look it up? Here, I'll just look it up. And is this like for the S and P? All right, Sh Schiller P E ratio chart. Let's see S and P five hundred. Um, let's see if this is it. I'm going to bring this up on the screen. Will I short the market? Uh, yeah, I probably will short the market. I want to see an uptick. You know what? I'm going to short the market when I see, um, I don't know. I'll let you know. I'm keeping it day to day. I don't want to make a, there's so many changing things right now that I'm still constructive on the market. So I'll short the market when the technicals break and the macro starts to align with that. And because uh, right now the macro forces are negative, but but also a lot of people are off sides. And I would say that we're still kind of on trend. We're coming into that 200 moving average. And I think uh, I don't want to short the market because we're headed into the fourth quarter. And the fourth quarter is typically you get the strongest seasonality. And we just got seasonality. So I don't know if I want to short the market yet. We'd have to get something really bad happen. Let me jump over to that Schiller P ratio, see what it is, see what this is about. Okay, so this is what I have here. All right, so Schiller... PE ratio chart. What are my thoughts on this? Um, Black Tuesday. Let's see, what does it do? Price to earnings ratio based on average inflation adjusted earnings from the previous 10 years, known as a cyclical, cyclical adjusted PE ratio, CAPE ratio, Schiller PE ratio, PE, blah, blah, blah. So, price to earnings. So, we're talking what? Price to earnings um, adjusted to inflation. This was okay. So that spiked in 2001, um, 2020, we spiked up a little bit P ratio. I don't really know what this is. The here, let me, let me, uh, let me throw this in chat GBT really quick. I mean, my thoughts initially are that, uh, I don't, I don't think we're overvalued. I know a lot of people say we're overvalued. I don't think we are. I don't think the market is overvalued yet. Bring this over here because look at uh look at all these indexes bro like iwm's getting smashed the p p price to earnings are not overvalued we'll go into earnings look if earnings drop significantly then prices will go lower but the market is looking at the forward looking indicators or else we would have got crushed already right the market should be getting crushed significantly i don't think that's even helping uh that's even happening so let me look this up though i want to see uh Schiller
Oh, from Robert Schiller. He's the he does a case Schiller home price index. Um, and this is for S and P, right? You're looking for S and P anyway. Maybe for specific stocks, it, it'll work. Um, but I would say right now, I don't really, I don't find it that valuable, the Schiller, Schiller P ratio. I know a lot of people uh, will say that, that it's a big deal, the Schiller P ratio. But right now, it's it comes down to Fed liquidity rates, right? That's the bigger deal for this. If this is, is the, if this is a barometer for will investors buy stocks, um, yeah, it, it is important. What it, what it means is, uh, Tigger, is that they will not buy overvalued stocks that cannot grow earnings in this high rate environment, i.e. if you cannot be efficient as in cost cut, still grow your revenues, um, then you're, you're done. You're pretty much done. So stock pickers market, right? That's what I say. I think we're in a stock pickers market. And who are, who's going to benefit the most from that? I mean, companies who can cut their earn I'm sorry not cut their earnings companies who can grow their earnings can grow their revenue companies who can use cash who have a lot of cash and can use that cash to uh to to basically put it in the money market funds and support themselves they can support their own growth so the the best will survive in this environment not the whole market only the best survive the only way the market comes back is if QE comes back faster than expected or those macro forces start to ease off Right. And that's going to have to be if something breaks. So the dollar just chugging higher, right? Just this big move in the dollar, not good for stocks. Stocks peaked or bottomed when the dollar bottomed, right? October, what was it? Uh, June, July, August, September. Yeah. This is where the dollar, this is where stocks actually peaked last time. Okay. What the hell's going on? Oh, huh, that's weird. Anyways, that's where we peak. So we need these macro forces to peak out. I don't care about the K Shiller, blah, blah, blah. Um, now, individual stocks, different, right? Apple, Amazon, Google, Meta, Am uh, Netflix, maybe. Let me see. I think Netflix is getting hit because they're, pro they're probably done getting hit. But Netflix is, is a little in trouble. Dude, my charts are like freaking out. I think Netflix is in, is in trouble a little bit because um, the user growth. I could be wrong. They're they're extremely oversold. They'll probably pick up there. They'll probably pick up here. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Microsoft. Those are just the mag sevens, right? Tesla has a little bit of issues, but I think Tesla's demand is going to come out on top. Pretty soon they got the Cybertruck. They have a lot of catalysts. Uh, Target, right, getting smashed because their real estate's getting destroyed. Their inventory is getting destroyed. People are not spending at Target. They're going to Walmart. Um, so certain industries are getting absolutely smashed. If you go to utilities, which is Q, uh, XL, XLU, look at this big drop in utilities. People are dumping these stocks. Why? Because they hold a lot of debt. So and, and they have to roll that debt immediately. So these these stocks are getting smashed. That's what I would say about the K Shiller stuff. Oh my gosh, a lot of comments. Hold on. Sorry, I missed out on a bunch. All right, so what do we got here? Yo, Jeremy, you helped me out a lot. Hey, shout out to you, Yasin. I'm glad I was able to help you out. That is my mission to give you a better perspective on the market, not tell you what to do, but to at least, you know, give you a better eye from from where I come from. That's why I have Josh on here so he can give me a better eye on the macro. I made a lot of money with your your view on the week. Hey, appreciate it, man. I'm glad you were successful. Shout out to you. Keep it up, bro. Keep learning. Uh, keep learning as much as you can. Take notes. AMD is in a descending triangle pattern for four months. When breaks, yeah. AMD's. I like AMD because like AMD doesn't matter. Like consumer spending isn't gonna affect AMD. Uh, they're they're getting chips. They're gonna get stimulation from the government in Q4 with the Chips Act. So AMD is one of those asymmetrical bets that doesn't matter what the economy really does, right? AMD when it breaks out, yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be nice. Still keeping your eye on AMD. I almost forgot about AMD. 
but AMD looks good, 100%. Uh, if you want to short the market, I'd wait for a retest of the head and shoulders neckline on SPY if it's a valid pattern. The biggest drop is after a bounce up and a rejection of the neckline, right? That's what uh, that's what I'm saying. I think we need to, if I'm going to short, I wouldn't short it here. I would wait for the RSI to move back up significantly. I want to see a really sharp move to the upside. And then, um, and I know you guys are looking at that neckline. Let's see. Do we put it here? Right? Is that where the neckline's at? Is that what we're looking at? I think so. So yeah, if you do short, maybe a bounce up into here. I'd even say you could probably get uh, a little more movement than that. I would say somewhere, because this was where the gap started, right? So I like gap fills. So what I would say is probably the best short on S&P is a gap fill reversal. Okay, it fills the gap and uh, it, it reverses. Let's see if we could zone... Uh, Dive in a close. That's that's my strategy, anyways. Is there's a gap here, right? Once we fill that gap to the upside, I want to see it get. I want to see the gap reverse. So that's where if I short, I'm shorting there, which is what four thirty eight. Yeah, that's what I would say. That's where I'd short S and P. What else we got here? Um, what happened today? Market's been so bad. What happened today? More rate risk. Thirty year yields rising. Pretty much dollar moves up, oil's not moving. So macro force is tightening. If you're not familiar with those are, subscribe to the newsletter. It's free. Um, I think we talked about some upside this week on the newsletter. People are still very off, uh, over, you know, positioned out of the market. Look, at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of demand for quality stocks, for efficient quality stocks. I think there's a lot of demand coming in. I'm trying to look over my notes uh, to see if there's anything that changed. Margin debt is at all-time light. Everybody's getting super bearish. PC data was really good. Um, if something does break, it's going to be regional banks or commercial real estate uh, or floating rate borrowers, and the Fed steps in to save them. So you might get a... Uh, yes, yes, the uh, the macro forces are tightening, but at the same time, copper's down, wheat's down, nat gas is down. And when you talk about yields, well, only the two the two-year yields are not going higher. It's just 10 year. So I think everything is offsetting itself, right? Consumers are, their incomes are still up versus the previous two months. Um, their spending is down, which helps inflation. The household financial debt to disposable income is still very low. GDP is still on track to be at 2%. The manufacturing index is starting to turn up, which means economic activity is starting to turn up, which means investors are going to be trying to front run this. So I'm still bullish on the market. I am not bearish yet. I'm 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 bearish short term because the macro forces are tightening. Uh, so I want to see a release in those macro forces. I want to see the dollar come back down. If it holds and bounces at 106, I'm gonna be like, damn, that's not good. If yields come back down and bounce, that's not good. If oil keeps going higher to 100, that's not good. I'm I'm hands off. We might consolidate. My biggest bet, I think, right? This is what I kind of think. I don't want to say my biggest bet, but what I'm thinking here, we see guys, is I think we see. I want to mark this up. I think what we might actually see is, dude, why can I never find my tools? Like, am I special? Am I special here? Okay. So I think what we might see, let's go to the whoa, one day. Let's go to the one day chart. And let's ro rotate over to SPX. I got too many things marked up. There we go. I don't even know how to use trading view. Somebody hit the button. Yeah, I'll, I'll explain ISM services. So what I think we're oversold, okay? We are oversold here. Uh, we're going to bounce, right? How high do we go? I don't know. We either break to the upside or we just bounce here and then we roll back over. So I think what's going to happen is we're going to hit that 200 daily moving average. We're going to bounce. Here's your short opportunity. I think it's at the trend, right? It's literally, bro, why don't I know how to use trading view correctly? It's literally at the trend. So here's where I think the best short opportunity is, meaning you're you're hitting the downtrend and uh, you're filling the gap. That's where you short, okay? But it still has room to still move up. So we still have time here, okay? If it doesn't, if it breaks out, great. Market's going higher. If it doesn't, we're going to come back down, probably retest the 200 again and just stay in this muddy area, 
right? The only way we break lower is if something really goes wrong. So that's my guess that we that we we still have time. What is this November? So we still have all of October. I think late October is where we see a real move happen. We either get here by late October or we're moving sideways. So those are your scenarios. Obviously, it's like duh, those are scenarios. But where's the key levels at? 4,400 for SPX, 4,400 is the key level. Uh, the gap fill, dang, is it 4,400? That's way different than SPY. So 4,400 for SPX, that's the key level. That was, uh, that was a, yeah, that was a big level in general. Um, that's the key level there. Do we get above that level? And we got to take the data in stride, man. There's no clear data, anything. You, you add your variables back and forth and you take it in stride. Uh, so that's what I would say we're looking at. Would you say, what, uh, do you go over the news tomorrow that would affect the dollar? Yeah, we did go over that. Um, let's, let's double dip. Let's do a double dip here. So what's going to affect the dollar coming in for tomorrow? What else we got here? Please never stop explaining. I'm going to, Hey, I'm going to go as high as I, I'm going to go as much as I can, right? I'm going to go as much as I can. I'm trying to get to a thousand on YouTube. So I can open up different features to make the stream a little better, but I'm going to, I'm going to stay up to date with this. I like the, I love the markets. Very competitive. I like it because it's competitive. I can be wrong so easily. I don't like easy things. I like hard things. And this is hard. This is tough. Trading and watching the markets has taught me that I don't know. Shh, right. You don't know crap. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep your head on a swivel. Um, so anyways, tomorrow, what are we looking at for tomorrow? Today was job openings. That really was a negative. Look, I was wrong. I was like, job openings are going lower. Duh. We're seeing a lot of risk. Nope. They went higher. Market freaked out. Also, you seen you could read my Twitter so you could see exactly what I'm saying. Um, tomorrow, we got ISM services. Uh, you want to be looking at new orders. Are those picking up? But really, services, service prices, are those up or down for tomorrow? I, I will tweet out on my Twitter the uh, my response for ISM services. I think even tonight. Now, are ISM services going to be that big of a deal? Maybe. I still think they're going to be pretty strong, but the big day is going... Wait, today's barely... No, today's Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was Wednesday. All right. Um, ADP employment change also. The big day is going to be not even Thursday. It's Friday. Thursday, you don't have much. Uh, so I think it's going to be Friday. Um. Oh, so you, oh, you nailed that trade, Yassine, huh? I'm thinking you saw job openings go up and you saw the dollar go up. Yep. Let's see what else we got. The problem with uh, data is that the same forces that make us go down is the same forces that could make us go up. It's very difficult to know where the market is going right now. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. That's why I look at the data. I have a prediction on the data on uh, not what it'll do, but what the market will react. And then I have to go verify what I said, what I think with the actual forces to see, OK, is it reacting how I expect? Now I can capitalize. If it's not, I have to take a step back and say, wait a minute. Why is it? What is it doing that I didn't guess? How do I adjust my thesis based on that? Uh, learning. So, Hey, I'm glad man. Shout out to you. Hey, you know what? Shout out to you guys for, for, uh, for being loyal, <laughs> right? Loyalty is key. Shout out to you guys for sticking on there. I appreciate you guys uh, showing up. have somebody, I'm not here talking to myself. Um, but yeah, I'm glad I'm, I'm glad you guys are learning. That's the key here to learn as much as you possibly can. I'll, I learn a lot of stuff from some of the stuff you guys throw out too. Um, do you have any experience with GAN square? I do not. Gan squares? I do not. I don't even know what that is. Never heard of it. I also hear. I also learned some stuff from Scooby Dooby, even though half the stuff he says is is a uh, crap. No, I'm just kidding. Um. All right. What do you say? What what for the 200 week to break, retest, and reject? Oh, you're waiting for the 200 week. All right, Scooby Dooby, take it easy. If you already took, I don't know if you took off already. Doifer, what up? Yeah, I don't have experience with that. Um, okay, let's go over Tesla. Let's go over Tesla and Chainlink. I'm, hey, guys, I'm so bullish on Chainlink. I might actually sell a big chunk of my Ethereum to get more Chainlink. I'm just like, whew, I'm getting bullish. All right, so Tesla. Whew, why does it look like this? Oh, because I adjusted the trend. 
uh, who cares? Let's take this off. We're already far into it. We're here's 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 where we're at with Tesla. Um, I almost shorted Tesla today again um, at two forty seven fifty, but I'm just like, ah, is it worth it? Because it might go down, but the market is so the further the market gets oversold, the less likely I am to short Tesla because I think it's going to bounce. If the market bounced strong and Tesla didn't move, then I probably would have uh, uh, shorted it a little more because I think something would have happened. And when I say short, I'm playing with options. I'm not like just straight short massively Tesla. Anyways, Tesla is still holding this previous level, right? Here's your here's your big level. Um, if we go all the way back to June, right? What are we looking at? 240-ish, 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 right? 240 to 242. Here we go again, 243-ish, right? A little higher. We did drop it, and then we capitulated right back up. So I think this is the big level somewhere around here. It's not like a perfect level, but you're looking for intraday price action to confirm the level strength. Okay. So I want to see us kind of climb and hold what 247. That's been a big level this week. 247, 247, 247, 247. Nothing here today did a lot on 247. So now I'm kind of changing to 247. I still want to see the hold of 250. But definitely 247. That's what it's looking like for Tesla. Um, I'm doing nothing yet. I still think the market's going to bounce. And then I'll, I'll, I'll check out Tesla. But when you take a step back, look at this big wedge forming. This is a dragon wedge for Tesla. Right off the highs, wedge, wedge, wedge. I love this. So when I see this, I want the S&P. I want to see NASDAQ bounce, get back into the uptrend. And... That whole time I'm monitoring Tesla because if we do break out here and we do have earnings coming up, I think earnings will come out to nothing, to be honest with you. I, was, I could be wrong, but I was thinking today, earnings might be a net nothing. It might just go up really quick and then come down and do nothing. Um, that's my guess. I think it's going to, I think earnings are going to go by and then Tesla's going to uh, price in whatever earnings were and then move up. I don't see a big move. I could be wrong. Maybe they announce FSD. I don't know. Uh, but I think they'll do nothing. That's just my initial guess. So a lot of support at 247. We're still in this really tight wedge. The 200 daily moving average is pointing higher. So we're we, you know we're starting to get elevated here on this one. Um, oh shoot, I'm still on this guy's. Let me let me let go of this guy's. Uh, who cares? I'm on the LinkedIn. Uh, Gan is time analysis, not not just price. Okay, Gan is is price. I use Gan, but that's not something I'll share. Took me over 80 hours just to kind of understand GAN techniques. Okay. Dang, yeah, that's too high level for me, guys. I don't do GAN. If I was day trading, maybe. But I use price action. I just use price action, volume, and I'm more discretionary. I don't like too many indicators. Not to say it wouldn't work, but, you know, I don't want to get analysis paralysis. Uh, so you, you got to experiment for sure. You do got to experiment. I nailed it because you explained what would happen if it went up. Yeah, that's an easy one. That's an easy one with the macro and the dollar. Right now, those are easy to tell what's going to happen. Tomorrow with ISM services, though, I don't know if ISM services are going to be that big of a deal because they've already been expanding. So if they weaken, that might actually help the dollar go down. Okay, and yields go down if they weaken significantly. If, if it strengthens, well that might make the dollar go higher and yields go higher if it strengthens. It's pretty much that simple um, for ISM services. But it's already been expanding, so I don't think it's that big of a long-term deal. I think it's just going to move. The the manufacturing's in, in recession. That's why that one, I'm, I'm a little more uh, focused on manufacturing because it's been in such a deep recession. Um, okay. Hey, we've been on here for two hours. Big long stream. Shout out to you guys. Like I said, don't forget to hit the likes. Hey, hit the likes on the YouTube. Let's get the likes up. So please subscribe if you are already subscribed. Uh, help me out there. If you're on TikTok, I'd appreciate you guys. Uh, if you guys could jump over and just subscribe to YouTube if you're not already to help me out with the algorithm and get to a thousand. That's my goal. And then my next goal is 10,000. So we'll see how that works out. I recommend GAN for macro studies. I can send you something that's freakishly accurate with GAN in regards to the possible tops and bottoms. Yeah, send me that. Send me that carbide. Send me the uh, the GAN stuff. I'll, I'll go through that. I, I still have, look, I have that indicator up that you were using, the CMF. I've been taking a look at it, and it did tell me that there wasn't real buying happening, and it was true. 
it was true. The S and P, um, it did bounce here. We got that bounce. Oh, look at now it's moving up. The S and P bounced, but the CMF was still pointing lower. And I was like, huh, interesting. Use that with RSI. RSI bounced, but this didn't. So now I know. I want to see the CMF bounce and the RSI bounce, and then I'll be a little more optimistic. So I like that. Appreciate that. I still learning from you guys. Like I said, I want to learn as much as I can from you guys. You should look into it. it's amazing how geometrical the market is. You should have some some GAN tools. I think yeah yeah. There's I think I've seen it before. I think I've seen the GAN tools. There it is. GAN box. GAN square. GAN fan. Shoot, where do you start? Where do you start with the GAN? Let's see. That's crazy. Look at that. It's like a rainbow. Hmm. Let's put this on a uh, Tesla. The GAN tools. GAN, is that how you is that how you pronounce it? GAN. All right, let's see what this looks like. Ooh, looks like Tesla's gonna roll over. But that's from this area. I wanna let's come in a little for it. Oh, you can okay. So yeah, I'd have to experiment with these. Let's go here and here. If it breaks down, comes here. I don't even know if I'm using them right, but it's probably a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, you need s to square your chart based on the price and time. Most people just overlay it and it won't give you accurate results. Oh, okay. Is that what that GAN square was? GAN, GAN, GAN square box or whatever? Boy, this is this is crazy. This is a lot of stuff here. So you got to square it first and then it looks pretty cool. I'll, hey, yeah, send me that stuff. Send me that stuff, man. Um, I'll look into it. Anyways, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll report a little bit tomorrow on ISM. Um, ISM services, the big day is Friday. Like I said, the markets, like the yields are crushing the market right now. Bond yields going higher. Uh, you want some, we need relief. Uh, you need some relief. And the thing is, they're so overextended. Look at this RSI. There's, oh wait, that's not, that's not it. The bond yields are so overextended. It's just more likely that they do come down first. Um, so if I did short the market or got bearish, I want to see them come down and then hold and then move up, which is literally uh, the bond the bond market. I want to see the bond market reach. It's so oversold. Look at this. Most oversold since back in October. Right. Extremely oversold. So I want to see bonds bounce first. And then uh, I want to see that bounce back into 92-ish previous support. And then uh, if it doesn't, if it starts to roll over again, then I'll get bearish the market. I'll probably be more bearish the market. I'm like, all right, yields are about to get up. It doesn't mean I'm super long bearish. It just means I might start a short position um, and then see how it plays out. So that's what I'd be looking at. But yeah, bonds are getting ripped. Somebody's going to come buy these, right? The Fed's going to, maybe the Fed will change their... They're bond buying. Um, they're not the Fed, the the RP. Maybe, maybe the Shadow QE will come in and buy these. Uh, I doubt it. They don't give you enough on it. So these guys, these guys will capitulate. These guys are shorting. They've made a big move. They've been shorting for a while. They probably started a monster short. They're up eight percent. They're gonna cover off of something. Even if ISM comes comes in super weak tomorrow, they might cover. They might cover. That might actually be good news because they cover. Yields go down, and while man manufacturing is recovering, services start to roll over. That could be a thesis. We could see that for sure. We could see that. Now, let me double check, uh, make sure I didn't miss anything um, for the Twitter, because uh, we went through a lot of stuff. <sighs> U.S. corporate net interest payments are falling. Corporate corporate payments are still falling. It's very bullish for the market. Um I think this is what I had. What did I have up here? Yeah, this is all I have for the market going forward, guys. Okay, we didn't really get through it too much today, but basically,
All right. Basically, who's going to break first? If markets, if the bond market keeps going up, right? Yields, who's going to break first? It's going to be the regional banks. Watch KRE or commercial real estate. All right. My, my camera went out. That's fine. Um, or commercial real estate or maybe retail. I don't know. But when we look at uh, corporate bonds here, okay, when we look at corporate bonds here, uh, not corporate bonds, corporate interest rates, look at them fall during QT. They're not worried about it. So I think there's going to be a bounce in the market. There's opportunity for the people who missed out. Market psychology tells me, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm betting on this, that there's going to be buyers coming in to grab some of this big tech. They need to make money, right? Uh, this The S&P looks a lot like it did back in March. It bounced on the 200 moving average, okay? And it moved up and it rolled over and made a new low. That's what we could see here. That'd be the negative, right? But at the same time, the marking of the low for the S&P is going to be somewhere around that 200 and somewhere around bond yields peaking. On the right-hand side, you can see bond yields peaked, the, uh, the, the market bottom. Bond yields peaked and the market tried to bottom and then it finally did bottom when they really started to peak. So I think that's the game plan here is it's, it comes down to yields, right? It comes down to yields and we'll find out. Anyways, my camera went out. Appreciate you guys always, as always, stay blessed for the rest of the day. Um, it's saying service PMI going up would be good. Service PMI going up would be, would might push the dollar higher and rates higher again. Um, yeah, it'd be good for the dollar if services go up because that means the economy is a little too strong. I don't think it's as big of a deal as today with the jobs reports uh, because the Fed didn't really say, because because services is also productivity and productivity doesn't necessarily mean inflation, right? But uh, prices paid, if you see ISM prices paid really elevated, possibly the bond market freaks out again and keeps going higher. But look at the closer we get to an overextension on the bond market on the yields, the more overextension, the more ch the probability starts to uh, starts to slide in the favor of, the, of of yields coming off and dollar coming off. So maybe one push higher and then it comes back down. I don't know. I think the, the better risk reward is that the dollar retraces back down and then it goes higher. I think it has to come back and then go higher. It's going up way too much at the moment. Um, doesn't mean it can't go up, but I think that's, you know, that's your risk reward there. It's all probabilities. Um, so yeah, ISM. I'll look at my Twitter. I'll I'll put some out tonight on the on the uh, services. All right, all right, all right, guys. You guys stay blessed. Appreciate you again. As always, stay blessed tonight. Get your workout. Get your your diet in. If you haven't, eat healthy. Take care of yourselves, and I'll catch 